Hello folks and welcome to our game here this Monday morning with myself Shane Stapleton joined by the returning Michael Verney who is now a fresh daddy. <laughs> you're, you're a new daddy Michael Verney, what's it been like the first couple of weeks? Uh, welcome a little bundle of joy into the world. Yeah, I don't know about being fresh, but I'm a, dad, I'm a daddy, all right, yeah. A uh, bit of a culture shock, but sure, it's, it's brilliant. The uh, start of the Camogie Army. Uh, have one of, 50, one of 15 now. <laughs> Just what, need to get the serious action over the next 10 or 15 years. What's, a, what's been the biggest shock to the system in the first couple of weeks of having a new child? Uh, just the different times uh, the sleep deprivation hits you and you're just like, the best way of describing it is, you know, say you're after, I don't even drink now, but be the same you with yourself after a hard night out and you get in around five or six in the morning and you go to bed and you wake up two hours later and you're, you know, you're just like, it's like you've been run over by a train. That's kind of what it feels like even, that's what it feels like most of the time, to be honest. So with having you. a baby is like having a bad hangover. That's what you're saying. Oh, it's having a, it's like having a hangover that could go on for a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, it's brilliant. Um, It's brilliant. It's, it's a real kind of surreal experience. Actually, this day, this day two weeks ago, 5.47 in the morning, this day two weeks ago, yeah. Um, Ash is great, yeah. And just trying to, had a bit of paternity leave, so trying to just get back to normal life now, I suppose. Yeah, and uh, fair play to, to Elaine, who was doing all the heavy lifting <laughs> well, work. Well, I, did, I, I did a very secondary role in it all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a reminder, we're brought to you by orgaretro.com. Use the promo code OURGAME and you get 15% off. The jerseys there are absolutely unreal. Look at this little Claire one here. I'm a fair sport wearing a Claire jersey here today, considering what's happened. <laughs> uh, it's, it's funny, like, like, I'm obviously back today, but you could also say the tip are back. Back under holes. <laughs> <laughs> Bernie, there's no need for it. Do you know what? Isn't isn't it ideal that you're back today rather than last week when uh, a certain Timing is, is everything. Timing is everything, Shadow. Timing is absolutely everything. This it was here this time last week. Um I would have taken a fair hammer but sure, listen, a week is a long time in Hurling. Um I think what is it? Is it two championship wins out of your last twelve? I hear a lot now, we'll chat about it a bit more. I hear a lot of people saying, you know, that you know some people saying that Tip got rid of their manager and look at where they are this year. But to me there was an awful lot of improvements this year. But that was really disappointing Saturday evening. It was a bit of a no show, to be honest with you. And you have to say, like the Offley game aside, which you know, it was a turkey shoot, two of their last three performances had been really poor. Like yeah. really, really poor. They haven't shown up. Um and I wonder, you know, just even thinking about it, does does Liam Cahill have a small bit of a problem with the round robin in his you know even when he was with Waterford and now a tip about maybe peaking too soon or peaking too soon in the season potentially as well but uh, tip are gone everyone's happy and the hurt let the let the hurt let the real hurling season commence henceforth. Okay, so for anyone who was hiding under a rock, it was Galway one twenty, Tip one eighteen, Clare five twenty six, Dublin two seventeen. Means the All Ireland semi finals are the same as last year. Clare against Kilkenny, Limerick against Galway. We could end up with a Galway Clare All Ireland final. And here to preview the Galway Clare All Ireland final, Niall Corcoran and Tommy Gilfoyle. And over a couple of steps from that just yet. But uh, Niall, Tommy, how are you? Good morning, lads. <laughs> uh, what, what, Tommy, we'll just start off with you. What did you make of that performance from Clare on Saturday? And how much of it was down to how good Clare were? How much was it down to how bad Dublin were? Yeah, I think there was a bit of both, I think, Shane. I think Clare were, you know, very impressive. I suppose it was a game that we were expected to win, but didn't didn't expect to win by the margin that we did win. Was very disappointed with Dublin, in fairness. You know, I would have thought that they would have been in transition, but they seemed to be way off the pace and way off the physicality and intensity needed at, at this stage of the championship. But from a Clare point of view, the job done, probably... The negative probably, you know, remains to be seen about uh, the injury count. But uh, all told, um, you know, we did what we had to do uh, relatively comfortably. Mm. Niall, obviously you, you were involved with Wexford again this year. You you know those Wex are the Leinster teams very well and obviously, you know, still operate in Dublin with Kilmacud Croaks. What did you make of the Dublin performance and how the season ended up? It was very disappointing. Yeah, it was a uh, disappointing, Shane. Um, I thought... Uh, I didn't expect Dublin to win the game, but I definitely thought the margin uh, would have been closer. Uh, I thought that uh, you know there was too much space given to I think the Clare forwards and really hurt hurt Dublin at the end. Uh, players like David Fitzgerald caused caused total damage in the middle of the field for Dublin, and they just couldn't couldn't get a handle on them. 
if you're looking at Dublin as a whole, you know, I thought they performed very well against Galway, and I, and you know, I thought there would there would be a a bigger performance. But I suppose um, looking at me, all done. Who he's 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 a few months in the job, um, and there has been progress from that from that point of view. But I certainly thought the gap would have been a bit closer than, than it actually was. Mm, Michael, Shay, or uh, now you're just on on Dublin. Like one of the biggest surprises for me, and you've obviously played against them already in the Leinster Championship, like. The middle of their defence was just wide open on so many occasions. Like the the three, I think three Tony Kelly goals were like uh, mm. were almost like a game of football where it was a long kick out. Everyone was pressed up. The ball broke and the whole thing was open. It was kind of it was bizarre to see it at senior inter county level. Yeah, it was very strange, uh, Michael. Looking back at it again, I suppose first of all to say that's that's where people like Chris Crummy and Keenan Callahan are, are a massive loss for Dublin. Um, you know, can't replace players uh, like those. Uh, I thought the matchups were very strange. Uh, I know we Paddy Doyle on on, on uh, Tony Kelly, and um, you know Paddy is having a fine season. But I think it when you're looking to shut down someone like Tony Kelly, you, you need somebody who's essentially not interested in hurling. Um, and uh, you know, I, I thought the matchups maybe. I suppose hindsight's a great thing, but um, you know, would would Paddy Smith or someone be being a better fit for for someone like Tony Kelly? Um, look, Connor Burke is a fantastic hurler. Um, is he a natural centre back? You know, possibly not. You know, when you have the Chris Crummy Crummy not on, on the setup in Keno Gallen, you know, uh, they are defenders, and uh, I think looking looking back at that. Um, and no doubt we all will, and the lads will review that. They will look at look at that defence for sure, and look at why. First of all, there was so much space, and once you give those clear forward space, you just it's it's, it's impossible to uh, shut them down. You know, there were times as well that Connor Connor Burke was playing six, obviously, and he picked up an air yellow. But there was times where he was like tracking Shane O'Donnell out to the middle of the field, and it just left an ocean. I couldn't. I was just surprised. I know I'm not a big fan of necessarily playing an extra defender or whatever, but it's just I couldn't believe that there wasn't somebody minding the house nearly at all times, you know. Yeah, and I think part of that was I thought Claire used the ball quite well at times. You know, they they worked the ball up the field. Um, you know, they, they play a very good possession game, and I think Dublin kind of didn't get a handle on that. I think we struggled from Dublin perspective, struggled in the half forward line at times. Claire got the overlap and it was really good, you know, good ball going in there, like some Mark Rogers, Tony Kelly on the breaks, and Shane O'Donnell. He particularly had a he was very influential coming coming in towards half time. He was electric, you know. So I think from a Dublin perspective, again, um when you look at what Galway did to Tipperary and be able to shut down that space, you have to be really ruthless in terms of blocking up that space between your full back line and half back line. Maybe Dublin just weren't compact enough in that area. Yeah, Tommy, just to talk about the positives for Clare here, Tony Kelly with three four. And the last time a Clare man scored a championship hat trick, we all know what you went on to do that year. Mark Rogers scored one six from play. He was brilliant. Shane O'Donnell won two from play. Dave Fitzgerald four points. An awful lot of lads gave excellent performances. There's the downside. John Conlon, he seemed to suffer a concussion. Hopefully, he'll be all right for the semi-final. Conor Cleary's still not there. But uh, will you start off with the positives, Tommy? Yeah, I suppose the, you know, the goals, I think, because I think uh, some sometimes I think when, you know, Clare are on top of teams that, uh, you know, we don't convert that to scores. And I suppose have that ruthless streak that maybe, you know, the real champions have like Kilkenny where, you know, you get a goal and then you try and bury them. You know, I think that's the first time Clare have got five goals in a championship match in a long time. Um, but I suppose from, you know, creating the scores, we as a, a team seem to, you know, get a lot of our scores from the midfield and, um, you know, it either goes over the bar or it goes wide. I think on, 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 on Saturday, you know, we hit the inside line, we hit, Rogers and 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 Peter Duggan on the inside line with, with, with good ball and and as a result we got a score we we got the scores from it um you know just the form I think Mark Rogers has threatened you know to he, he has done it sporadically you know for maybe 10 15 minutes but I think on Saturday was his most complete performance in a clear scene or jersey we all know what he can do in his ability but I think you know we need to you know, make him our marquee forward where we supply the ball to him that suits him. You know, he can win his own ball. Um, and again, I suppose, look at scoring 526 in a quarter final augurs well for the future. Uh, you would take into account the, you know, the opposition. And I don't think we're getting carried away, 
carried away in Clare by, by by the score line. Um, you know, I think I agree with Niall. You know, the space afforded to Clare. I don't think they could believe their luck. And when they sensed that there was that opportunity there, you know, they drove through the middle numerous times. And uh, you know, you won't get that space, particularly the next day against Kilkenny. But what what I was really happy with is that they showed a real intent to get goals. They showed glimpses of it against Limerick. When we got the first goal against Limerick, probably, you know, we win for a, a second and third one when we could have tapped it over. So from a clear point of view, 526 is a good score uh, with good performances from, from, from players. But um, look, at I think it'll be a big test, in, in a bigger test in two weeks' time. More physical, more intense and... Uh, uh, certainly, I don't believe we'll be scoring 526 against Kilkenny. Yeah, Niall, like, it's three and six are going to be a big problem for Clare, but, like, there's no doubt that the Banner were the better team and, you know, obviously won very, very comfortably. But I have to say, there was, a, like, throughout the game, and Tommy will, will probably confirm this, I was very frustrated with what I felt was one-sided referee in the game. I thought Dublin could get nothing. Like, David Fitzgerald took at least eight or nine steps. He's a class player, but he does regularly take eight or nine steps and he's led away with it. He set up the Rodgers goal after definitely doing steps. Before that, Adam Hogan clearly pulled down Paul Crummy inside the 21. Nobody back. Should have been a black card. Should have been a penalty. Like a lot of decisions I felt went against Dublin. Not enough to change the result, but it made it very, very hard on Dublin. Yeah, it was um, those decisions once they go against you and you're already under pressure, Shane. Um, I think if Dublin needed those breaks to Stephen to try and stay in the game. Um, but you're right, it wasn't the reason, it wasn't the main reason they lost the game. You can go back to the refereeing and, and the, the black card, probably a couple of moments. But we're back for this season where we might have felt there was a, a black card needed, um, but you know, ultimately it's down to the referee and, and seeing that. And that's a that's maybe for a, another a, another discussion around you know how, how that is interpreted and how it's implemented. But yeah, like you still have to look at Dublin and and, and say, look, how you know. For, for me, looking in on that and, and looking at the, I suppose, the working into Dublin hurling, um, you know, again, just disappointed, I suppose, with 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 the gap that that's there, particularly after those performances against Galway and Kilkenny in the Leicester Championship. It's very kind of uh, disappointing to see to see, um, I suppose, how easily Clare were able to penetrate that 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 Dublin defence and, and uh, you know Dublin also struggled in, in their half forward line at times Donald Burke is obviously a massive loss for them and uh, I think Clare got on top there pretty early and and uh, it was it was very hard to see see Dublin come back absolutely the, re the refereeing decisions <laughs> didn't help things but as you said it wasn't it wasn't the reason they lost the game mm. just on Clare as well Clare had two four scored after 31 minutes they proceeded to score what 322 for the remaining 40 minutes. like that, that is some tally to be conceding. And I, I get what you're saying, Shane. There were, a couple of, there were a couple of referee calls. I don't think they had any big bearing in the game. Alex Constantine probably took eight or nine steps for his goal, having been pulled just before that as well. Um, but, like, Clare could have been out of sight. Clare could have been totally out of sight at halftime. Could have had, could have had something like 5-12, 5-13 at halftime easily, had they not been hitting so many careless wides. And, Tommy, I suppose just in the second half, the ball that was going into the Clare forward line was totally different in the second half, wasn't it? It was far more direct. I think there was a lot less mess than I would say kind of going on. They were playing lovely ball into Rogers. They were playing decent ball into Kelly. They were playing a uh, good ball into even O'Donnell. That, or he was, you know, roaming around the half forward line when he was on the pitch. But it was kind of a different Clare in the second half. Yeah, I, 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 I think um, you know, you're right, Michael. I think uh, you know, I think Clare sometimes, you know, around our half back line and midfield have a tendency. You know, to to go for the the long range score. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, I, I think we need to be, you know, more creative. And, and and I suppose you know when you've you've an inside line, you know, at times with Shane O'Donnell and 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 Mark Rogers inside, it's dropping that ball five ten meters in front of them, you know, at an angle. But I suppose when you're on top, out the field, you have that time and space to do that. I think that's an area Claire can and and, and will improve on. Uh, because most of the top forwards or, or the top teams at this stage have two marquee forwards on the inside line. You know, it, 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 it all comes down to the quality of ball going through. Now, we have good strikers, John Conlon, David McInerney, Dave, you know, Dermot Ryan, obviously Tony Kelly and, and all those. But but there's there's times when, you know, it's, it, it's the right decision. 
is to keep the ball alive, you know, hit the D, bring it near to the scoring zone, and you will get a return. And also, you know, I suppose you'll ask questions of a defence because, you know, if you have an inside line that's been supplied with uh, with, with perfect ball, there isn't really much the defence can do. And, you know, we saw that in the Munster final, I suppose, you know, there was a lot made of, um, you know, Aaron Galland's performance. But, you know, you would question... You know the, the how how our 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 outfield players allowed Limerick the time and space to look up to hit Galan exactly where he wanted, and that's an area you know that we can improve on. We can put more pressure on the opposition. Uh, you know, to, and I think we will do that against Kilkenny. Obviously, they have a tendency to they, while they're working it through the lines, they 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 can go along as well to an inside line, and you know we know the players they can stack in that full forward line. But from a clear point of view. You know, I think it's, you know, probably it's 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 something we're working on is is the delivery of the ball, uh, and again, you know, it's going to get harder as as you climb the ladder, and you know, Kilkenny the next day, I'm sure, you know, will put maximum pressure on on the on the Clare defender. So, you know, it may be back to the old style, get it forward as quick as you can, and and hope for a break. Dogan has that ability to win the ball. Shanahan when he came on. But, you know, in, inside primarily Shane O'Donnell, Mark Rogers or Ian Galvin, you know, w- would like the ball hit in, yeah, you know, to, to their advantage. So that's a, a, an area we can work on. Just a quick uh, update the all Ireland Senior Football uh, Championship quarterfinal draws we made this morning. Um, definitely got one of the draws that everyone wanted anyway. Derry Cork, uh, Armagh Monaghan, Kerry Tyrone, but Dublin Mayo, uh, and <laughs> another chapter into, the, into that saga. Um That'll be that'll be absolutely fascinating. Shane, just a quick reaction to that, even. Well, I think Dublin Mayo, yeah, we all kind of want that. That's going to be an absolute cracker. And the way Mayo beat Galway, uh, Niles uh, Galway yesterday, I'm sure you're caught up by that being a good football man. Um, <laughs> man and I don't really want to see another all Ulster clash, but look, it would still be good. Kerry Tyrone, actually, that's yeah. very interesting because Tyrone are in great form now and like. Will Kerry want the physical battle that they're definitely going to get there? But look, we'll come back to that later on because we've John Mahan coming in. Um, Tommy, ultimately, is this fullback and centre back issue going to cost Clare if Conlon can't start? Isn't right, and if like because I don't think Conor Cleary has been replaced, and it's like at times Paul Crummy was in there, ball wasn't coming in. Danny Sutcliffe, I thought, did great damage in that first half without scoring as that much, but like he was winning ball after ball, and obviously Considine caused trouble too. Oh, Shane, it's it, it, you know it's very it's it's going to be crucial that clearly you know is fit and ready to play and Conlon can 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 say because we saw what happened last year when Conlon was out you know we we just didn't have uh, the personnel and we we made a couple of changes that didn't work out but factor into that David McInerney missed yesterday's you know missed yesterday's game or Saturday's game as well so I think from a, a clear defensively we, we need to have all our our players fit and available. Uh, again, you look at Conor Cleary. A lot of people, you know, you w- would be questioning him, but we we didn't really miss him until he was gone. We don't have anyone similar. He's your spoiler defender. He doesn't do the spectacular. He just does the, uh, the you know, the, the 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 dirty work around there. Lets the ball into the keeper, breaks it through. Conlon has settled into that centre back role. And I think when he went off, you know, and David McInerney missing, I suppose, you know, we can forget about that. We ended up with a relatively inexperienced backline. I would say made up by guys that are used to playing maybe a cornerback or wingback. You know, Rory Hayes went to centre back, not a natural centre back. Uh, you know, Adam Hogan took up uh, or in, in, in on the inside line. So I think for Clare, particularly coming up against a Kilkenny forward line that will probably include. John Donnelly, Walter Walsh, uh, Mossy Keown, TJ Reid, Mullen, Cody. We will need to have our top defenders available, our physically strong defenders, because otherwise Kilkenny will, you know, they will sense maybe that there's uh, there's goals there in that in that in, in that full back line, and they will they will stack that inside line and go for it. So from a clear point of view, you know, Cleary and Conlon and McInerney, you know, need to be 100 percent fit. And then, you know, then we, we, we will be in a great chance. But we're just going to have to wait and see. I suppose something in Clare and, you know, I'd be involved in, in a certain amount of media work with Clare FM. And we hear nothing that's coming out of training. We don't know the team or panel until half an hour before throw-in. So it's, there's a lot of speculation. 
We also have, you know, Aidan McCarthy is carrying an injury that, that didn't play. He wasn't in the 26. So there's a lot of unknowns. There's a big two weeks ahead. But I think from a clear point of view, we need everyone fit, available and ready to take on Kilkenny in, in, in two weeks' time. Will it be a wild one to throw Aidan McCarthy centre-back when he comes back? Because the forwards, you know, there's plenty of scores in the forwards. He has played there. I remember him playing there for UL. Uh, he's played wing back for Clare as, as well previously. Would that be a wild one? Uh, look, it needs most, I suppose, uh, you know, when it comes to it. I suppose last year against Kilkenny, um, David McInerney stepped in and he would be comfortable enough at, at centre back. But I suppose you're Robin Peter to pay Paul, um, you know, there. In Clare, probably down the years, we always had loads of backs, defenders. We were always short. We always had a couple of forwards. Now I think it's the reverse for whatever reason. We have lots of forwards or like like for like players in defence. When we're missing the likes of Cleary and Conlon, we don't have ready-made replacements. You know, our under-20 team, you know, had, had a lot of, you know, they're young and inexperienced, so maybe not ready to step up yet. Adam Hogan has made that step up and maybe, you know, down the line, someone like John Keneally, who has played very well for the 20s and and, and, he, and indeed he played for his club yesterday in the league semi-final at centre-back. He may be, but in the short term, you know, what they'll do, who they'll put in. I, I expect Conlon to be fit and available. Probably Cleary, the doubt will be there. You know, his game time and, and, and training and all that. And the fact that it's a dislocated shoulder, you know, will we'll have a big bearing on it. But, um, yeah, worrying times from a defensive point of view. So, fingers crossed and clear that, uh, that the medics... Uh, can get their job done and we have the best 15 on the field in two weeks' time. Yeah. Niall, do you expect many of the, the Dublin lads that are away this year to be back next year? Do you expect Dublin's fortunes to improve in 2024? Uh, you'd hope so, Shane. Look, there, there has been progress uh, this year in terms of you know getting that third spot in Leinster. Um, I think the performance against uh, Kilkenny and against Galway. Sorry, guys, I don't know if you can hear me. My screen went blank there. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. There. Oh, good, yeah. Apologies about that. The performance against Kilkenny and Galway were, were quite encouraging. Um, and again, it's just, uh, I suppose, getting that consistency. Like You would love to see Chris Crummy back in, in the fold and maybe Keno Gallagher um, back in the fold for next year. Um, I think developing more scoring forwards. I think, you know, Danny, Danny was looked, looked, did look a threat inside the full forward line. And maybe, maybe is that, that, is that his home for the next couple of years? Um, Paul Crummy beside him. I know Alex Constein and, and, and what he can do also. Um, Donald Burke. So maybe, you know, you build on, Don, on those guys. Um, but, but you, but you would, Dublin do need uh, a full hand to pick from. Um, and you would hope that would be the case in, in, in 2024. Like the word, the word positive Saturday, when you look at, 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 um, say the crossfield ball that Dublin played into the inside full forward line, like, like there, there was a threat there. So, um, that's something that, that, that you can build on. So Mark Rogan, um, you know, for his first year inside, I know he's a, he's a Crokes man, probably a bit biased, but for his free first year on the panel, I thought brought energy around that middle third. I'd actually play him wing back. I think he's a brilliant wing back and even at six, but he did quite well midfield this year. Um, you mentioned Paddy Doyle. He's another young player. Um, he's a fantastic hurler. Um, I don't know if he's a man marker, but he's a fantastic hurler and he he's going to going to get better. So um, you have to give give, give these uh, give these guys time and maybe look 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 at how we how we re reject the forwards a bit and look at look at a couple of more scoring threats. I think. Mm. Can we Niall, where, where are Dublin's underage? Where would you consider Dublin's underage to be? Seventeens and twenties currently. Like, is the future bright or? Does work need to be done back there? I suppose we and Claire would be bemoaning the fact that we, we, you know, we weren't successful, and now we're all Ireland minor champions after turning around, you know, a, a, a team that got beaten by forty-four points. Where are Dublin, Dublin's underage uh, situation at the moment? Yeah, I suppose when you look at at, at the minors set up the last few years, even this year, I suppose they were they were well beaten by Galway, Tommy. Um, so there's a bit of a gap there, I guess. Um, and our twenties, um, again, I think, uh, I think it was awfully, awfully had, had yeah. beaten them. Um, so, like, there's probably, if I'm being honest about it, you probably need need to look back, look at look at that system again and see and see, see where the shortcomings are. Uh, you would like to see more progress uh, in that aspect. Like when, 
remember when the likes of Liam Rush, David Tracy, some of these guys were coming through. Like Dublin were really strong, um, you know, at, at secondary schools level. I know Clash though and have, have had success uh, over the years, but that needs to be more consistent. Um, there are Dublin have done really well in 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 developing hurling from a, a participation viewpoint, but I, I just think there needs to be more work done around, around development. And there are lots of clubs in Dublin who are promoting hurling. But I don't know. I, I don't know. I think that there's support needed around development, like the coaching, the expertise. I think there's a lot of clubs who, who could do with help developing developing uh, hurt, um, more hurlers uh, within Dublin. I think when you look back at, at my time playing with Dublin, like the likes of the Dio Tools uh, were quite strong. Um, we had, you know, even Mark Statio Callan, uh, St. Pat's Palmerstown with Liam Rush and, and I think Shane Stapleton at the time. So you you, you guys come from those clubs, that's probably not the case anymore to be honest about it and i know you have new clubs like maybe i won't say new clubs but you've you've near uh supplying players now and you and, and aaron's isle and maybe that'll take a bit more time but i i do think you you know from a dublin perspective you, we do need to review um particularly how we can support some better support the clubs and promoting hurling in the county yeah, you're not the it. first. You're not the first person I've heard say that, Niall. That the quantity is not necessarily an issue, but it's now that it's the quality of coaching yeah. that needs to go in. And like having the quantity is a luxury. It's if, but if you if it's a matter of I don't know, like they obviously need to probably look at uh, GDAs within the county and getting more out and get more quality of coaching and get more quality of coaching mm-hmm. within the clubs. Is that kind of something like what you'd be thinking? Yeah, definitely. I think I think that's 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 the element of it. And like a lot of lot of the GPOs in Dublin are, are to be fair, are promoting vote codes. But I, I think when you look at development of hurling and I, look, I, lads, I can only speak from my own experience with with Kilm Good Croaks, and we have huge amount of numbers. But I mean, what people aren't seeing is that they like every Sunday or, or most weekends, like Chris Croaks hurlers going down to. Kilkenny to Tipperary, Galway to to play to play games, to play in little, little blitzes and 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 to develop develop the skills. Uh, Croaks underage are probably you know quite dominant in terms of numbers, but in terms of getting that challenge and I, when I say challenge, it it's that optimal challenge. It's, it's keeping those players playing the games. It's it's getting a different experience of maybe what hurling looks like um in different parts of the country and, and getting capturing capturing the hearts and minds as is what a few people have over the years have said here in croaks and, and i think that's definitely something um that if we're looking to raise a standard of hurling in dublin I, I think clubs need more support because clubs do want hurling to thrive but you know uh, i suppose people are clubs are, are really comfortable in, in 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 coaching football dublin is is you know, is 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 fo- a football county. So uh, I think clubs just need support around developing hurling um, and and supporting coaches in developing hurling in those clubs. And uh, there, I think I think that comes down to coach education as as much as anything else. Yeah, there's, there's no getting away from it. Like in some county or in some clubs, hurling does drift within Dublin, and then some of the players there frustrated with the preparation levels will probably drift back to football. And a lot of clubs mm. that potentially could be very strong at hurling, I think, because it's more of a football county. And it isn't looked after properly they're just a bit like get a bit fed up with it but i think there's always talent in dublin it's just it's we're, we're probably per club not getting enough out of it up, up here are, the, are, are the right people getting involved now i suppose we in clare here would have always said that you know the work was being put in and through development squads and that but you know to have the right people involved at the top of the organization or the top of the groups we in clare this year had brian o'connell former clare player and turns Fahey with the 20s and it was generally you know agreed that I think uh, you know the, the the best people were involved who had the best you know of everything around them and and that reflected then in the team's performance are the right people getting involved in Dublin that's a good question Tommy you know I, I know like I know I know Colin Burchill has been sick asking asking uh, I suppose players of, of my generation to come back and get involved and I know people like Dotsie, Gary Maguire have got involved in some of those teams, maybe you know more more needs to be done on that um, but certainly from a, a Dublin J perspective uh, I, I do think we need to look at, look at not only I suppose past players but also, players are people who have the knowledge and the skills uh, to go uh, to go and develop that. I think when Dublin hurling uh, 
you know, and that, and that, that blueprint c- came first. There was lots of really good people. I remember like, you know, like the McConnelly driving that and, and, and the work that was done on that. And that was based around participation. And there was, I suppose, key structures put in place. One of those being a uh, number of GPOs uh, in Dublin to, to, to promote boat codes. So that, that in, in, in a sense, that box has been ticked now, but the question is around around development now and standards and, and where that looks like. And maybe part of that, Tommy, is getting those is getting past players involved, but also you know people who have who have the, the knowledge knowledge and expertise around how to develop coaches and how to develop players within the county. Mm. The we, big, the, yeah, the big the big thing I see, you know, we we can't allow, you know, and I know it's it, the, the the result doesn't reflect Dublin hurling, but you know, I suppose we have what eight or ten counties that can win in All Ireland. We can't afford any county slipping back. I think you know, from a general hurling point of view across the country. You know, we've, what, six teams in Leinster, five in Munster that have chances of, you know, winning the All-Ireland. I mean, is the is the effort being put in uh, by the GEA to, you know, to bring up the standards? And that's a general across the site. You know, I, you hear different um, people say, you know, it's a close shop. There's only eight teams that can win it. Like, I mean, does Dublin and, and the likes of Dublin have that real desire to, to, to go after an All-Ireland? Or is it just... You know, we will do our best and, and see it where it takes us compared to the football side of it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, uh, I just saw a comment there and the dual player come up, lads. And, you know, I've, I've, um, kind of my experience at Wexford the last couple of years, I've, again, I've probably, probably ignorant today. So I did not realize the, the amount of clubs in Wexford who are, who are dual clubs and, and the amount of guys who play football and hurling. So, and, if I'm being honest about it again, I I don't think the the I think Dublin can succeed at both codes. Uh, if you know, I think the numbers are there, but I I think there does need to be a strategy around around development for hurling. Um, so how we do that, you know, what, what does that what does that plan look like? Is that is that looking at development squads again? Is that looking at uh, support for clubs? And I think clubs. And indeed, secondary schools. I think that there's there's an element of that that needs to look at, particularly our, our you know, our secondary schools uh, and and players who are transitioning from from primary school. And just a couple of weeks ago, I was in the Crow Park, and you could see the the fantastic work, um, you know, with with young kids getting a chance to play in Crow Park and represent their school, um, you know, at that primary level. But I think sec- the secondary schools one is a is maybe something that, that we need to need to need to get a better handle on in, in Dublin. And you know, the jewel thing, look, uh, I'm just I see it here in I see it here in the croaks and you know, uh, both codes are thriving because, you know, I suppose there's, there's cooperation, first of all. <laughs> um, and also there's hopefully good structuring of people in place who 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 are who are developing those players. So why can't that be done across the board? And uh, brilliantly, we've gotten this far into the show without talking about Tipperary being out of the championship. So, fair play hey, Shano, I also noticed as well how you referred to Dublin as we a couple of minutes ago. It's amazing how you've, how you've jumped ship so quickly. Well, I, I don't know if that's on the strength of what happened at the weekend. Yeah, well, I, I didn't want to bring it up because uh, as well as winning the quarterfinal, <laughs> the, the, the camaraderie and uh, the friendship shown to yourself and my, my, my sports... Um, re, um, Man in Claire FM, Derek Lynch, like that. That really made my day. Claire winning, you and 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 Derek talking, and then I went home and I watched Guns and Roses on Glastonbury. So it was a great evening. <laughs> <laughs> it could could it be a better day for Claire people, uh, Tommy? Then Claire booking their place in the Ireland semi final, and then Tip exiting the championship about an hour and a half later. Well. There was a lot of smug faces and lads hiding behind things going out the gears in the Gaelic grounds. But look at, uh, I mean, I, I I I stayed and I watched it not for any to hope to see Tip beat or that just purely from a hurling point of view. Yeah, Tip were disappointing, no doubt about it. Um, I think you know they came with great expectations. Um, you know, would have been disappointed not to make that monster final, and I'm not sure how much that altered their their preparation. Were they peaking for that? But um, very, very disappointing. You know, we know Tip have the hurlers, but they just struggled. I think in the first minute, the first uh, half, to make any impact uh, as the forwards. You know, players of, you know, Mark Kehoe, Jake Morris, Shami Kell, and Jason Ford. We they just 
it, it looked like that. I won't. I don't want to be disrespectful, but they were clueless. They were running into contact, losing the ball. Uh, you know, and, and again, I think only for you know if Conor Whelan had been. You know, uh, he could have had three goals before halftime and the result could have been a whole lot worse. Now, credit, I'm not sure it's credit due to tip for coming back. They were eight points down or for Galway losing that lead. But, uh, yeah, disappointment for tip. I think um, Galway would be happy to get over the line and, uh, you know, into the semi-final. But tip, uh, you know, another winter of of um, of, of Todd, Todd, you know, they just need to... I don't know. I, I suppose they're in transition. I suppose maybe the expectations based on Liam Cahill's return may have been too high in his first year. I'm sure he'll go back and he'll review. And uh, I don't think Tip will be going away, but uh, another ye- year out. Yeah, and again, while Clare are in the Ireland semi final and Tip are out, uh, you know, we'll be happy in Clare, I suppose. <laughs> Basically, Not- Tommy, what you're saying is disappointment for Tip. Joy for everybody else. Yeah, go away. But joy for Claire. I can only speak from Claire, and and and, and uh, you know. But um, look at every every man for himself. Shane is, I'm sure, will be well able to defend uh, the, the the tip side of it, and uh, we'll look in depthly as he usually does about uh, where tip went wrong, and I'm sure we'll we won't be shy in pointing out where, what needed to be done. That's four years in a row now to, to try and analyze where it went wrong. Niall, let's talk about the positives of Galway. <laughs> Dominated this game, to be fair. Yeah, it was, it was. Uh, I think just made it into a battle to, to close that space up the back. And I think what was really interesting was the, were the performances for pe- players like Sean, Sean Lanan, Keenan Fahey. Uh, they really came to the fore. Tom Monaghan Tom came on and got three points. Um, Evan Nyland was busy. Like those guys really stepped up. Um, you know, Keenan Fahey in particular was a really good target uh, under the bookouts. Sean Lanan did a fantastic job on the likes of Noel McGrath. So I think that was a real positive. Darren Morris, he was really solid at cornerback. And then you had people like Dahi Burke driving out. Uh, the two Mannions were, were, ex- were exceptional. And, um, you know, the other thing was when you, when you look at when goal, we can feed ball and get good ball into the likes of Conor Whelan and Kevin Cooney. Um, the damage they can do, and I felt at times, you know, over the year, and even last year, uh, that uh, Whelan has to work so hard at, to win the ball. Uh, but when it's put in front of him like that, you know, he, he is he is a threat. And I think that goal just after half time, really, I suppose, you know, that was the gap in the end um, between Tip and Galway. So I think Galway, Galway would be very very pleased um, with their performance, particularly after the Leicester final, and because you could see. Henry after the game and just looked at his interview yesterday again and I suppose the you know he nearly the emotion uh, he showed having having come and having um I suppose having put that Leicester final uh, to bed and uh, the performance they got from that so I think Galway uh, particularly from some of the, the newer players like Kevin Cooney, Fahey, um, Sean and Anne, I think I think they'd be really happy with that. Just a word, Niall, on Cottle Mannion's role. Uh, I couldn't believe yeah. that that tip just put ball down on top of him and didn't occupy him. Um, he, he was basically free for nearly the whole game. One of the best, like one of the best ball strikers, one of the best link men, one of the best distributors. Like I couldn't believe that, but it's yeah. a kind of a new role for him uh, in recent games. And like I, I, I'd love, he must have had twenty five possessions, and I'd say he hardly gave away one of them. He's so influential. He's a like he's a brilliant ball striker, isn't he? When you when you look at him, like he's really accurate, really good in the ball, can carry ball well. And I think if you're if you're playing against that, I think Tip didn't help themselves in striking the ball from the twenty one. I think that just gives people like Mannion a chance to get across the pitch, get on the ball. And that was the interesting thing about Tip, where they, they they've gone away from their plan of working the ball out, and they reverted back to I suppose uh, long ball from. From 60, 70 yards out, and uh, I suppose when people you've someone like Colin Mannion at the end of that, like he's going to hurt you, he's going to carry the ball, he's going to get it into the key forwards, like like uh, like Whelan. And, and it was interesting to see that Tip didn't either didn't put a man a marker on him, just get a forward out there to occupy him, or if you know that that he's a free man, that you just need to get the ball higher up the pitch, you just need to get the ball higher up the pitch before you get it in there and 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 get it down the wings and. Uh, that didn't happen from a from a tip point of view, which was which was probably strange to see. Mm, yeah, like uh, looking at Tipperary, I mean, ultimately they saw that Galway were sitting back hugely, and what that meant was that at times Connor Whelan was inside the forty five at the other end of the pitch, one v one with Ronan Maher maybe twenty yards in front, 
when Galway came out with the ball, you know, after Tipperary had just lumped it down onto numbers as if that was going to work, they ended up just blasting it, uh, hitting a lovely ball up the field for Whelan. And like Carl Barrett, who hasn't played in five weeks, you know, he was given the impossible task of trying to keep into Conor Whelan. And with Whelan after scoring 1 6 in the Leinster final, like his confidence has turned around. Mm. He's in the hurler of the year conversation, Niall, now, surely. Uh, yeah, like um, he's he's been fantastic, and I, I think he's really. I, I, you look at the, look at him in the Leinster final playing wing forward, and then use the inside gesture. So he's really coming to the fore. Um, but but, but I, I think part of that Shane is is Galway uh, can, can, are using him better. I, I think I think they've been guilty in the past of. You know, he, for me, if he, if there was a transfer market, you know, he's he's the first forward I'd be I'd be looking at because he's he's so physical. He's one to one forward that can win his win his own ball, and then once he gets it, it's impossible to take it off him. Uh, and now Galway have have have, have, uh, have learned to, to feed him properly. So I think he's a he's a he's a really he's a, he's he's just one of those forwards where. Um, you have to keep your eye on him, and that even if the ball is lumped in, there's still a, still a chance of him getting his hand to it or getting touched to it because he's he's so physical. So, I think he's on fire, and um, I think he'll be he'll be he'll be a handful for Limerick in a couple of weeks. And and also, Niall, you know, there's all this talk about Tipperary and did they peak too soon and train too hard and all. And like, I'm not asking you to comment on another county per se because obviously you're operating in Leinster there as well. You don't want to be commenting too hard on how other counties are specifically going. But how much do you have to deal with when you're trying to deal with the league and energy-wise and peaking and all this stuff coming into a round robin? Yeah, it, I presume maybe the accusations now thrown at Liam Cahill will be that they have to get fitter. And it's probably the opposite, to be honest. I think uh, I think it's so hard uh, to, to manage uh, a season. And, and, you know, even my experience at Wexford, you know, you, you'd work closely with the S&C coach, coaches around your, your you know, periodizing your, your training plan for the year to ensure that you can peak at, at the right time. And um, I've no doubt Tipperary, uh, you know, did that. Obviously, it looked like they were flat the last the last couple of games. And I think they'll probably just have to go and review that. Um, they've, they've introduced some new players again this year. I think I uh, heard, heard uh, Liam Sheedy say last night they probably had a tough winter. But uh, but that'll probably stand to them next year. You're, those guys are probably coming back now with a with a higher base. But it, but but I think from a league perspective, and even that, I suppose when you look at the Munster Championship, tip have tip have had to come through. There's they've had to be ready for every game, and you know that's 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 uh, that takes its toll too. So um, there's there's careful planning and consideration, and that needs to take 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 time and take uh, during those seasons. And I've no doubt tip have done that, and they will have learned. No doubt they'll have, they will have, they will have learned from. From this season, and as Tommy said, they're not gone away. Um, they they will be back, and uh, I think Liam, as you could see, he was just really disappointed in the flatness of that performance. And you know, sometimes it's just very hard uh, to put your finger on that. It, it, sometimes that can be just a, as much mental as physical. That's and uh, you know, o- only the players really know um, the root cause of that. I guess. You could actually hear him as well during the game. Um, you could hear him shouting at Rhys Shelley during yeah. the game as well to speed things up. There was no, um, there was just no zip or energy to tip. It was a kind of a, it was a weird one. And even I think the the long ball that you were talking about, Niall, I think that's that can even be a tiredness kind of thing. That the the, the effort, both mental and physical, to work it through the lines that requires a huge amount of energy uh, on both sides. But it was just, yeah, I just, I, I, I I'll throw this back to you as well, Niall. As, as encouraging as it was to see that Galway performance, it must be hugely frustrating as well because like they should have been out of sight, really. Uh, if they put the boot down and deliver a 75-minute performance, you'd imagine they could beat anybody. But they nearly left Tip in that game. Like, Tip could have easily won the game at the end. Yeah, it, the game came alive. You know, 50 minutes gone, the game came alive. Then the last 20 minutes, Tip, tip were on the comeback. Um, I think you know, John McGrath was... You know, was influential coming on, and maybe he's just uh, I'm not sure why he's not starting. It. It's it's it's. Uh, but he for me, he's a he's a top forward, and uh, I think he made a difference when he came on. Um, I think Galway would be disappointed the fact that the, you know they were probably chewing off their fi- their their fingernails coming down the stretch when they had so many chances to win it. And even when you look back at at the Limerick game last year, I think Galway had enough chances to to maybe to me win, win that game. So I think they're. Their execution, and to be fair uh, to, to some of those players, once you, you listen to them afterwards, uh, I think they've referenced that that 
their execution needs to be better and it's certainly something to go after but I think uh, I think it's Limerick you, you, you just need to take in all your chances um, and uh, no doubt it's something that Galway will, will, uh, will have on the, on the work on in the next couple of weeks mm. Adrian McGrath says here Liam Cattle was one Waterford point from being out and produced a disaster tactically in Hurling yesterday yet there's little or no criticism just lads nearly sympathising with him uh, at the far side of the football I'll come back and Bernie's going to quiz me hard about Tipperary so I'll, I'll do a bit, bit more jaw about that then Tommy um, how good are this Galway team? Well, potentially, you know, they, they, they're all excellent hurler. I, I, as I said, as, as Nyla said there, I mean, if they can put together a 70, 75 minute per consistent performance, they're up there with the best of them. And I think winning against Tipperary will give them great heart and encouragement. I think they won't fear Limerick. I think, you know, that they will go on and think that, you know, they have a chance. And I, and I do believe that they, that they have. But I think they need to be more consistent. There's times... You know, if you looked at their season, which has fluctuated up and down, the Galway went down 12 points to Dublin and came back. They went down, you know, to, they went down against Kilkenny, uh, came back, looked like they couldn't hold it yesterday or Saturday up eight points. I think they need to, you know, at certain times in the game, they just need to manage it better and not allow the opposition. And again, you know, opposition will have their time on top. I think it's it's limit the damage on the scoreboard. And you know, I thought it was interesting that Galway, yeah, that Shefflin in an interview after made it quite clear that Galway set out to make it a battle. Um, did that suspect that maybe that Tip wouldn't be up for it? That Tip maybe wanted a more open style game, and Galway knew that they could. You know, beat him in a tough, tight, um, physical game. Go on, Tommy Boy. That's the job. You know, and, and that's, yeah, there's no doubt. Like, I mean, and again, <laughs> what, <laughs> where, but, but like, I mean, I think it's everyone has agreed. Tip have the players. But if you allow the tip players to play, they will play and they will hurt you. I mean, how undercooked were they yesterday? You know, coming into the game since the Monster Championship, what, what would they have done? How would they have gauged themselves? And then, now, Michael, no disrespect to Offaly. You know, there was a no test against Offaly. Yeah. It, it wasn't ideal. I think, you know, Galway came off, had hurt after losing to Kilkenny, had a real cause. Clare would have felt that they left the Munster final. We had a cause. I think Tip were kind of somewhere in the unknown as to where they were. And their performance reflected that yesterday, I think. And when it came down to it, I think Galway you know, reveled in the, the physical battles and I think, you know, won them all. And again, you know, I was talking to Ken Hogan, the Tip FM analysis, and um, I thought, you know, Bonner Maher, it was a game meant for, you know, suited Bonner Maher, but he was out injured. Someone to win that dirty ball, pass it off to, you know, Kehor that they just couldn't get their hands on primary ball from a tipper there. And that's probably something that Cal is going to look at. It's not all about the flair, it's, it, it's the fight. They need to get the uh, you know, get get the mix right there. And I think, you know, coming into the game, Cahill probably in his first year in Tipperary put put a big effort in very early on. You know, year two, he may do things differently. From a clear point of view, Brian Lohan is there four years. Shefflin is there two or three years. You know, you, you have to tweak from year to year to plan your to, to plan your plan your peaking. And obviously, you know, tip were flat yesterday for one reason. I'm sure they'll they'll look at it. But uh, at the end of the day, I think Galway wanted it more, fronted up better, and uh, Tip were found wanting. Lads, you've been great with your time. Just in a, in a word, then, who's going to win the All Ireland from here? Tommy, we'll start with you. I if 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 we've all our players ready, fit, and able to play, I think you know we'll have a great battle with Kilkenny. Uh, and if we get over that, you know, I think it's it's round three versus. Limerick or Galway, I'm not going to put my head on the block and say Limerick. Um, I think it's anyone's at the moment. Limerick, obviously, are the champions uh, and the favourites. Kilkenny took them down, took them, you know, took them all the way last year. We've taken them all the way this year. Galway will fancy their chances. In Woodward, uh, I, in don't, one, know. In one I word. don't know. <laughs> you win the it won't be it won't be tip. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Niall, do you have an actual oh. answer other than you know this windy <laughs> lad here just talking around it? Very similar to Tommy, to be honest, lads. It's hard to call. Um, I I think Limerick. I think Limerick are are are, are still 
um, in the driving seat. I think that that gap between now and the Munster final would have helped them. Yes, they're missing some key players, but I, I think they'll they'll get some energy back. And I think they just need needed that energy. I think that, and I think uh, they're still the ones to beat. Um, it, it'll be much tighter. Um, but I, I I still think Limerick are probably in the driving seat. Okay, well, brilliant stuff, Niall and uh, Tommy, and hopefully we'll be chatting again soon. Thanks, lads. Thanks, Cheers, Jess. Good luck. Thanks, Emil. Okay, delighted to say we're now joined by John Mahan to talk uh, a bit of football there. John, how are things with you? Morning, guys. Enjoyed that conversation there about hurling. Um, I, I take a great interest in it. So, uh, yeah, and I know Tommy from days back in Clare. Interesting, he hasn't changed. He's still sitting on the fence when it comes to making <laughs> big calls. Yeah, I'm good. Good this morning. Um, yeah, we had a cracking game yesterday. Uh, really exciting. And uh, it lived up to all the expectations as regards what we would expect from a Galway Mayo clash and uh, magnificent crowd, great atmosphere and uh, yeah, something we're very proud of this morning that we managed to get one over the old rivals. You're relieved, I'd say, John, are you? Like, like Jesus, at the, at the end, you were in pole position one nine to nine up and you're thinking to kick on and then you're holding on at the end, some drama at the end. Yeah, I mean, that's typical of a Mayo Galway clash and uh, obviously we were a little bit um, Undecided going into the game, in fact, most people uh, and friends of mine, including myself, we, we, we fancied Galway at home. We just thought they, of course, the big debate was about Sean Kelly and, and uh, obviously Damien Comer, and if they were going to be fit to play. As it transpired, Sean Kelly was limping around the place for the entire game on one leg. He, he didn't have the influence that he's had all year. He's arguably been clear of the year of the championship to date. Just and on Jamie that, John, just on, just on that, on Sean Kelly. Um... I can see why they wanted him out there, but is is you know is that the right is that the right thing to do um, yeah. for an overall well, squad as well? Well, it's the benefit of hindsight, Michael. Probably probably not because uh, I think with the exception of one burst in the second half where he laid, I think it was him. He laid on a, a great goal chance. I think it was for Matthew Tierney or, 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 or Corey Conroy. I can't recall exactly, but we didn't see those forays into the opposition. He's such a, an incredible athlete. And he's such an intelligent footballer. He just didn't have the influence on the game yesterday. And of course, maybe in hindsight, it might have been better at looking at an alternative because he clearly was limping around the place. Damien Comer also ham hamstring, but he had a big influence in that 35 mm. minutes he played in the first half. He was a real handful for our, our, our full back line. And anytime he he lurked in uh, and got a diagonal ball into him, he was just like a man mountain in there and he caused us all sorts of trouble. And unlucky enough, he could have had a goal. But uh, they were two significant losses, shall I say. Obviously, uh, Sean uh, continued to play down the full game, but uh, Damon Comer, to him going off at half time, I suppose, was a welcome sight from a Mayo perspective. But no, look at um, Mayo, uh, like, were full of spirit and heart. Like, I mean, we were a little bit uns unsure or uncertain as to what we'd get, particularly having seen such a, a blow power performance against Louth here in McHale Park and obviously against Cork last weekend. We just didn't really know what to expect. We always felt like playing Galway, once the draw was made, it was Galway, that would spark a Mayo team into a, a good performance. And while it wasn't brilliant, of course, wind affected both teams, particularly the first half for, for Mayo, the shot selection was was poor. Like it was very, very difficult to get inside the scoring zone and with, you know, with uh, Galway packing the defence like we did in the second half. It, really, it just didn't uh, end up being the great football spectacle, but it had everything else, the excitement, you know, as I say, the drama going down the last end. Kitty McDade had two efforts on goal. Our keeper got caught off the nine. And on another day, Galway could have snuck it. We just had that little bit of an edge. And I felt probably on the balance of things, probably deserved to get over the line. John, what, what do you make of the draw this morning? So it's Derry against Cork, Dublin Mayo, Armagh Monaghan, Kerry Tyrone. And it feels, you know, inevitable Dublin Mayo would happen and Kerry Tyrone would happen. I don't think there's any need for a draw. <laughs> we, we, all, we all suspect it, like, I mean, hot ball or not uh, in a drum, that uh, it would be Mayo Dublin. I think it's a great draw. I think uh, the only, I suppose, issue I'd have is can we uh, find the energy to go two weekends back to back? We've only six days really to recover. Or be it we got, I think we got through yesterday without any serious injuries. was always a blessing. But I mean, this week it'll all be about recovery. But I think. No more than drawing Galway uh, um, yesterday. I think the Dubs is a fantastic draw to get the juices flowing and to get Mayo really excited about this. It will fill the place, of course. It's a you know it's a very attractive draw for football because the beauty about a Mayo Dublin, no more than a Mayo Galway, you're going to get you're going to be entertained. You're going to get value for money because 
you know, both teams more than likely will go toe to toe. They don't uh, exercise the mass defences that we see some teams deploy, and you're you're guaranteed it'll be a flowing, open-ended game. And if we do go to toe to toe with Dublin, I feel there might be a small little bit element of vulnerability in the Dublin right now. It's the best time to probably, from a mayor perspective, if we have aspirations of trying to land the big one, now is the time to get Dublin. Like I mean. The other uh, draws, like I mean, Kerry, Ter- Kerry, Tyrone, like I mean, we know the history there. I think it's four all victories each over the last uh, t- um, eight occasions I've met. Uh, you mean Tyrone uh, have just sparked into, uh, you know, they've really come strong in the last couple of weeks. And uh, I-, I think they're the one team I w- would rather we're not playing because uh, we're finding it hard to-, to break down that mass defence. And um, but they're beginning to sparkle with the, the two, uh, the two uh, young, young fellas, them two young Taliban bucks are beginning to blossom at the right time. And they, they'll put it up to Kerry. But you just get the impression that Kerry are just beginning to play their best when it mattered most. The way they, they destroyed Loud would suggest that they're probably in a block of training when Mayo caught them down Killarney a couple of weeks ago. And I suspect it's all about timing and getting their hunger right for maybe a seven, eight week period. And I think they're just hitting the sweet spot right now. The other games, look, at it, it's hard to call. Like, I mean, an Ulster Derby there, you know, everybody, everybody, I think, has a chance uh, next weekend. And that's, that, that's what more can you ask for? That Armand Monaghan game is some chance for someone to be into the last four as well and potentially into an All-Ireland final as well. Well, you, you have to admire and applaud Monaghan. What's happening in Monaghan, a small county, and particularly, it's worth mentioning their minors now after getting into a, yeah. an All Ireland minor final for first, since 1939. Incredible how they're maximising what they have, the resources they have, and I really am delighted to see Monaghan uh, do do well. They've done brilliantly well because it was a gig that nobody wanted. They were just looking over their shoulder and saying, "Who wants Monaghan?" Like I mean, you know, McManus is at an age where he's been, you know, and he's been carrying them for years and. It was felt the hues of these boys. Nah, there's not another tune in them for us. And what they've done this year has been quite remarkable. Armagh, you look at you never, you never know. The only thing is, Reno Neal will be back, and uh, he can certainly make them tick. Um, yeah, they're coming in after, with a two-week break. You probably just might fancy Armagh. I mean, getting that, uh, I suppose, a good morale boosting victory over Galway will give them a pep in their step, and they have a little bit of momentum coming into it. Well, then every team has a bit of momentum. But you just feel the team that had the, the extra week probably might have a benefit of, of maybe coming up on top next weekend. Just and one quick know, one on Monaghan, John. Just one really quick one as a manager. Like, what they have as a manager is, like, you cannot buy that. You know yeah. every time they go out, they're going to eke every little drop out of themselves. I'm just thinking even through your own managerial career, is there any particular team you look back on and think, these boys are always going to give me everything, every day I go out? Because it's, it's phenomenal, as you say with Monaghan, they just, they get every little ounce out of themselves. Is there any team or particular that you would look back in your own career? Yeah, there, there's an obvious one, and I think you'd agree with me, that what Colin Connells did with Clare over the last eight or nine years has been quite remarkable. I mean, he's absolutely got every last ounce out of those boys. You know, and you felt when Brennan retired from midfield, they're going to fall away because he carried them. He was a, you know, every time he tagged out, he gave them incredible performance. But what, what Clare have done over the last um, seven, eight years, staying in Division Two, has been quite remarkable. And Colin Collins and his management team, now he kept reinvigorating his backroom team, kept bringing in new coaches and what have you, which was a very smart thing to do. So they always appear to have a freshness about them. But I think, you know, Clare in particular, and having been involved with them uh, back in the early 90s, just, you know, I, I, not the greatest footballers in the world, many of them, but they always had, of course, a couple of real quality players. And I could name six or seven of them straight away from my time down there that were just, they would uh, grace any and any team in, in any championship. But uh, they've been quite remarkable. But I have to say this year, Monan have caught the eye and uh, what Vinnie Corey has done with them has been just quite remarkable. I'm delighted for him because I wasn't quite sure if, if he was their first choice. I don't think he was. But when things got a little bit desperate as regards finding the manager, he put his hand up and said, yes, I take on the challenge. And I'm particularly pleased that he's gone and done remarkable things with Monan this year. And one of the things is there's going to be no repeat pairings in the semi final. So, for example, Cork couldn't get Kerry, pretty sure Kerry can't get Mayo because they met in the group stages as well. So that adds a little something to it. There's also an all Division II uh, uh, quarter final here, which means Derry or Cork are going to be in an All Ireland semi final. That's a rerun of 1993. And just to ask you, John, a bit more about Galway here. 
<clears throat> the likes of Comer and Shane Walsh, they're not far from 30 now. It's that this was year four for Porrick Joyce. Is it getting to that stage now where they be the window might be closing? Yeah, I mean, look at uh, um, we talk about Shane Walsh. Like, I mean, he's had a, a very poor year, but he had very high standards from last year. And you just wonder, like, I mean, he had a very poor uh, uh, National League final and the championship to date, even that last three against Armagh last year, you would put your hand up. He said he's going to absolutely nail this. It might be, it could be so much different for, for Galway. Had he scored that free above uh, that late free against Armagh. They now have an extra week to get to Sean Kelly recovered, to get Comer and other weeks of, of, of you know, um, preparation into him. But uh, you're right. I, I, I just begin to feel, Park did suggest, and I know he, he made a statement at the very start. I think he gave himself, was it a couple of years? He said, if we don't win the All-Ireland, I'm here to win an All-Ireland. We don't do that. And I forget, was it two, three or four years? He said, I'm out. So I got a couple of texts last night and said, look, it would PJ go. I'm not quite sure uh, whether he will or not. He, I, I think he'll be very, very disappointed with where he finds himself this morning because they have a lot of quality. But just when it came down to the home stretch, Matthew Tierney was just a revelation last year. You know, Kenny McDade was, you know, in the running for player of the year as a midfielder, playing very deep this year. And a lot of people would feel that had he played a little bit closer, uh, in, maybe in his best position at, uh, at midfield. But then he's trying to get, he's trying to get his best 15 on the pitch, and that includes getting a Maher into midfield along with Parry Conroy. There's another player who's given incredible service to Galway. You just begin to question, can he go another year? So there's a big question mark over Galway. Mayo have a lot of youth coming through. Um, Ross Gammon are lurking in the background. And maybe Parry this morning might be looking over his shoulder and say, listen, can I, can I go? Have I got the energy to go? He's a very, very successful and very busy businessman. Has his own business, obviously. And you just begin to question, will he go? I think Galway would be anxious to hop, hold on to him because uh, where will they get anyone better? He's got so much experience and guile. And uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens here over the next couple of days. And uh, I hope he hangs on because uh, he's, a, he's a good guy. Yeah, Kato, just that, we, we talked about uh, the lack of jeopardy in the All-Ireland series, but the way it worked out the last week, like the last week has changed everything for a lot of teams. Do you know what I mean? And it changed Galway's season completely. Uh, it ripped ripped it up, um, and it ripped it up, ripped up Mayo's season. Even though they've been able to turn it around again, but just you wanted to read out that comment about Shane Walsh, and I do think it is, uh, I do think it is an interesting one. Uh, Richard Hogan just says, ironically, could Shane Walsh's transfer and the football he played with Crokes have been to the detriment of Galway? Something he's never had to do before. Probably go the whole way through a winter. And he just hasn't looked himself, John, this year. There's no point in saying any different. No, there's no question. Like, I mean, uh, um, yeah, he, look, we know the talent. He is, we, we, we all know the talent is there. But without a, a doubt, his, uh, he's underperformed alarmingly. And I know Porek certainly would not have been happy to see the transfer request coming to joint uh, Crooks. Um, he did take a, 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 a number of weeks off um, after that all in club final. I think he went down under for seven, six, seven weeks. When... All his teammates were back here, busting their gut, getting ready for National League and what have you. I know there might have been an element of unhappiness. I can understand why he would do it, to get away, to refresh. But, like, I mean, with, without Shane Walsh firing, like, I mean, he missed freeze yesterday in the first half. He had a couple of strikes that he took. Ordinarily, he put them over blindfolded. But there's no question he underperformed this year. He had a poor season by his very high standards. And I know Park would be particularly frustrated with him in particular for a combination of reasons, but uh, it is what it is. But ho hopefully he'll come back refreshed because, and I'm, look, at, uh, I, I kind of say for certain, I got, it's an interesting comment. Did his uh, transfer affect his performance with Galway? Well, look, at, you could argue, we'll never know that, but um, it certainly possibly didn't help. And what about what Mayo did in this game? Kevin McStay, he completely changed around the team. He took out the likes of uh, Matty Rowan. Another thing is, there was a little bit of nastiness there as well. I know the footage is inconclusive, but it looks like Ryan O'Donoghue swung a boot across Sean Kelly, and obviously he was carrying that ankle injury. So yeah. there was, you know, a bit of an edge to Mayo. Well, look, at I, I, there's, there always is an edge to Mayo. I mean, and there's, uh, um, but there's never any nastiness. I, I have to say there's great respect. I mean, we, we, we hate them for 364 days or five days of the year, with exception that one day when we play them. But I mean, there's a, I, I mean, there's a universal respect for Galway Mayo, I would hate to think, and I, and I doubt very much, I know Ryan O'Donoghue is an extreme competitor, but I would, I would hate to think that he deliberately targeted Sean Kelly by stamping on him. And I did see the footage last night. It is inconclusive. 
and I would like to give him the benefit of the doubt. I wouldn't think that Ryan O'Donoghue, he's a he's a fierce competitor. There's no question about it. And look at, I mean, all you got to do is look at Jason uh, Doherty's jerseys. I think um, Aidan O'Shea had the, the jersey rip. That kind of stuff is part and parcel of championship football. There was I don't think there was any real ugly nastiness in in the game. That incident, I I, I have to say, I would give Ryan uh, the benefit of the doubt, but. Kevin McSay did change it up. He had to. There's no question about it. There's a lot of questions. Conor Loftus has been tried, I think, for 10 consecutive days. There's number six. Clearly, that was identified as a, an issue that had to be addressed coming into this game because the way Cork came right through the heart of a defence in, in the closing quarter uh, last weekend was an issue that had to be addressed. He did address that issue this year. I was surprised to see Matthew Rowan um, not starting to quite honest with you. I, I believe he had a bug. The same bug that Parik O'Hora had this weekend. He wasn't part of the 26. I do know that Matthew Rowan was not uh, feeding himself last weekend in Cork. So maybe the rest of him, particularly with now looking at the dubs, and he has done remarkably well on Fenton uh, previously in Dublin. So it would be fantastic if he comes back reinvigorated and back to himself. It'll certainly give Kevin another option. But I think, you know, the changes that may bring in Jason Doherty and... Uh, uh, Kevin McLaughlin, he suggested afterwards that he wanted the experience of the guy, of those guys, what he, in what he felt was going to be a real tough encounter. And they played their part for, for a period in the game until they were both uh, called ashore and it was freshened up by bringing in legs. Oh, McLaughlin, not the most complete footballer in the world, but by God, has he got some energy. And we saw him like him stumbling and falling into the, I, I, I forget what Galway defender it was before he kicked the ball, uh, even though it was disallowed. But well, he brings enormous energy. Like, I mean, he is a manufactured footballer who was a great cyclist until he was 18 years of age, but he brings great energy. So I think Kevin deserves uh, an applaudits for, for changing it up. He had to. He made four changes yesterday to the start of 15. And I think, obviously, when you uh, win a game by a single point, all of those decisions were the right ones to have made. So we can't argue with that. And you've got David McBride coming in, scoring one of the... Like, it was such a thrilling goal. Simple enough when you think about it. Runs through, hand pass, take it back and finish it. But the yeah, composure, he, I mean, selling it the eyes, he, you know, for the goal. Yeah, he's, he's been on, on, on the Mayo squad the last couple of years. And I know he's been talked about so highly down here. But unfortunately, he's had injuries over the last two or three years. So we haven't seen the best of them. This is the first time we're seeing David McBride and the qualities that he has. And we haven't had a genuine fullback for perhaps a decade or more. He is quality. And I can tell you, when he pulled the choke yesterday, he won the ball, I think, um, and played a 1-2, about 50, 60 metres from goal. But just, he put on the afterburners when he punched that ball into Aidan O'Shea. And uh, you just left two more defenders for dead. And what, you know, unlike a lot of full backs or corner backs when they get into that position to put on the blinkers and the blast, the ball, he was cool as personified. He just cooled the jets and kicked a fantastic goal. Like if that was the winning of the game. Matthew Tierney on the other side, uh, a couple of minutes later, had a brilliant opportunity to round our keeper and roll it into the net with a little dummy. He didn't. I would have expected that had Matthew scored that goal, well, you'd be talking to a goal, uh, a man here today and not to me, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big fan of pull the choke, John. I hadn't heard that one before. That's a good oh, one. yeah, I yeah, yeah. How would you know about it, Mike? You don't have a choke. You don't have a choke. <laughs> That's true also. Just a quick question for you here, John. Uh, Detox101 just asked, I watched Cork Mayo 89 last week for Teddy's Memorial. Uh, uh, some game compared to today. Does John think the football of yesteryear was better? What do you reckon? I have to say, with the exception of a few, uh, a few games in the championship, we have been bored watching some of the football. I have to say it's been appalling in many instances. We're lucky enough that we get these big rivalries. And I think it's only now we're beginning to rock and roll and see some quality football. But some of the stuff that we've, we've been exposed to in the last, not just this year, the last couple of years, this mass defence stuff. I mean, we're playing now with two, two or three quarterbacks. I mean, the mark has been a, a, a joke. I mean, 80% of them are one down on the floor. Uh, so there's no question we, we have a problem. And like, I mean, I fear that we might, it might, we might struggle to fill the stadium, but... Yesterday, we saw Pierce Stadium absolutely choked because those great healthy rivalries that exist between the Goals and the Mayos and even now coming into a, a quarterfinal between Mayo and Dublin. I mean, crowds will still come out in huge numbers, but unfortunately, what we've, uh, what we've been serving up as entertainment has been a disaster. 1989, 
it was kind of, I won't say records abandoned, but it was kind of end-to-end -end entertainment. And uh, it certainly was a lot easier on the eye from a, from a supporter's point of view. So I can understand a lot of people are getting frustrated. We saw that at some of the uh, the pool games, small crowds here, uh, McHale Park for the Mayo Loud game. I think there's only 11,000. I think with around 9,000 9, down at Cork. Ordinarily, you would expect if the entertainment value was better, you'd have another 10,000 at those games. So yes, there's an issue. Um, Larry McCarthy might necessarily agree because here he's looking at the overall figures coming into uh, Croke Park and uh, they would suggest, yeah, the pool stages have worked, but I'm not quite sure. I, I mean, certainly it's a debate for another time, but yeah, entertainment wise, we've been struggling a lot of the year. Just on, like, do you think that will evolve and we'll, like, we will go back to maybe more free flowing open football, or do you think there's kind of rule changes or things needed to, to make sure that are supposed to encourage? better football well, well look at it, it does require a change there's no question about it i mean kickouts maybe have the past i mean there's a million of them and everybody has an opinion of what needs to change but uh look at uh, um a time particularly watching the mayo loud game like i mean we had 10 options on a kick out late in the second half and i was suggesting at the time we should have done something like the mayo ladies did yesterday in that particular game that we should have sat down and said come on come on out to play because <laughs> When you see an opposition 15, not behind the halfway line, but behind the 45, and a goalkeeper having 10 options to kick the ball out, to say, look at, where's the entertainment? And I know I was sitting around, uh, Joe O'Connor was on one side, me, uncle of, of Killian and, uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the two boys. Um, and I had Willie Joe Padden with me. And we were just looking at each other in complete frustration. And I said, now's the time to protest. Sit down and say, Loud come out to play. I'm not just suggesting it's loud because lots of teams play this defensive setup, but yeah, it was it, it was boring. And Mayor nearly got caught and that gone down the home stretch. We only fell over the line with one point victory. So Loud might argue, well, it worked for that game. It certainly didn't work the final weekend when they went out to play Kerry. So look at I think it does require rule change. And uh, as I say, you could we could talk for hours of what might and might not have worked, but experimentation is required and I think now's the time for it. And John, like one thing that isn't boring is Mayo for Sam and just having the hype train going again. Like, it, I love this. I love when this happens and, you know, Mayo are going to do it, aren't they? Well, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I'm a little bit fearful to be honest with you. I just think uh, three weeks in a row, I'm a little bit worried that we mightn't have the energy. We don't really know what uh, to expect next weekend. But the one thing I would suggest, the fact that it's Dublin, I may, the Mayo lads will be absolutely you know, relishing this opportunity because, you know, this is their choice of hobbies. This is their liberation of ego. To go up to Dublin next Sunday and play in front of, I'd say, 70,000 crowds. I mean, what more does the young fellow work at that? What, or what more does the young fellow want? Isn't that just what it's all about? Just the, the opportunity to go and express yourself and enjoy, you know, providing an, an, an entertainment, hopefully. And I expect we will. But, uh, no, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Mayo it always give. Like, I mean, they're, they're a fantastic team. I know I'm talking about Beyond County. But the one thing you're guaranteed with Mayo is entertainment and, and a bit of drama and uh, lots of talking points and perennial losers. I mean, I, I, I grew up in the decade of 70s, never seeing Mayo win a championship game. Here we are now competing at the top table with the best teams in the country every year for the last 20 years. And we're bringing that incredible support with us. I mean, you've got to be thankful for, for, for the likes of a Mayo and the entertainment they've provided. And uh, I, I, I genuinely mean that they have done that and uh, they keep on giving. Mm, Mayo for Sam it is. So <laughs> if, if we go on to one of the other games there, Donegal, obviously they're out of the championship now. They lost 118 to 13 points. Uh, the two Canavan brothers, Rory Canavan, he scored 1-1 one, one, and Dara Canavan scored five, including one free. These two lads look just, they're really hitting form. I mentioned it just briefly earlier. Like, I mean, if you're talking about hot shots in the modern game and the two of them forwards, like, I mean, isn't that what you want to see? And you just want to see them, you know, being allowed to uh, go toe to toe or one to one with the defender because they have such guile and know how and game intelligence. And they're just sheer quality. I mean, but it was only a question of time. And I'm, I imagine, like, I mean, the Tyrone management have been holding these guy, guys back, just ready to unleash them. And it's a question of timing, not to expose them too early, make sure they're mature, mature enough and strong enough physically. 
Uh, but to see the way they can play and the you know, they're, they're, they're just sheer class and I can only imagine the fear of a one-to-one -one with a corner back or a wing back or a full back being caught one-to-one -one with those guys but they have you know they're two-footers they can uh they're so quick and uh, they're so smart like, I mean yeah super footballers but Tyrone I saw like I mean Tyrone down here a number of weeks ago in the league and I never saw such an inept performance I know I'd say the same when we play Kerry here in, in McHale Park, they were just absolutely dreadful. I never saw such an under uh, uh, power performance from two quality teams. But again, this year in particular, it was all about hitting the sweet spot when it matters most. And right now, they are beginning to embellish themselves and they're beginning to kind of sparkle just at the right time. And people ask me, well, John, who do you think for the all Ireland? And I... You know, six weeks ago, I said, oh, geez, no, I mean, look, Mayo are absolutely flying and our league performances suggest that. But I think we were fitter than every other team in the country last uh, February, March, January, February, March. And we were because we, I think Kevin came in and trained the team so hard and went after that National League title and we managed to fall over the line. Then we have taken a bit of a dip uh, in our performance because I think the team looked a little bit fatigued and tired. Matthew Ryan and these guys seem to have dipped. But now, I suppose... Now's the time to sparkle again. I'm just a little bit uncertain, whereas I think the incremental improvement in the Tyrones and the Kerrys is there to, for everyone to see. And I think it's all about timing. And that's why I think when it comes down to the home stretch, Dublin fall into that category as well. I just think that Mayo might be that little bit short. I hope I'm wrong, but I just feel we may not have the energy to keep going week after week. This will be our third weekend in a, in a row. And, you know, on the road, it's tough. It's, it's, it's tough getting around the place out to Dublin next weekend. That just saps a bit of energy. But I'm diverting off the, the point there about the Canavan boys. Yeah, it's great. It's, look, it's great to see. This is what we want. We want to see the best of the country. We want to see the Shane Watchers, you know, firing on all cylinders. And we want to see these Canavan boys in Cork Park. And uh, next weekend, we get to do that. Mm, it's the great I, to see with the Canavans, like you have the biggest shoes to fill, like of your dad, and they're both like it, they're both living up to it already. And Dara's obviously won an All Ireland already, but uh, they are definitely a joy to watch. And what you're saying there, John, I think is interesting as well. There's a couple of teams, Tyrone, probably Kerry, Dublin, who do, don't look like they've hit their peak yet, and I think that's the key. Have Mayo hit a peak and dropped, and maybe they'll hit another peak, maybe they will. I think the fact that, um, that Mayo obviously ended the, the seven in a row charge in 2021 and this is the first time they'll meet in championships since then makes it even more interesting and this looks like Dublin's last hurrah. I think that's another interesting aspect. For Mayo as well though, like they'll have to play three weekends in a row, they'll have to uh, to, to get to an All-Ireland semi-final, they'll have to have beaten Galway in Dublin. Like, Jesus, you love trying to do things the hard way. Well, like, I mean, that's always been the case with Mayo. We certainly do get things the hard way, but... And I certainly I would imagine Kevin did not want that extra game. I um, mean, we definitely did foul up against Cork, no disrespect to them. But in the last, uh, we didn't score in the last 18 minutes of that game, and it ended up being a bit of a disaster. We then felt, well, look at the paper, she had kicked that last three. We would have had a home game. It, we mightn't be here to, this morning talking about it because we, God knows who we would have played in McHale Park. We may not have won. And Pierce Stadium, believe it or not, is a lucky stopping ground for us. We have a had, I think that that's the third time in a row we've won championship up there or, or something around that. But look at, getting back to, to the Mayo, I, what I'm saying there is definitely they were they were sparkling that February, March, April. And there's no question, I mean, the results will, will, will testify a, a terrible performance against Loud, very poor in the last quarter against Cork. Uh, Roscommon, I beat my Roscommon the kind of championship. No question the dip was there. The, you know, the statistics will prove that. But just yesterday, we saw an example of, this, of a bit of a sparkle. Now, it wasn't a complete performance. And Kevin has an issue. He doesn't quite know what his best 15 is. We're going out now, second game in a row. We'll, what's the story at number six? Will we persevere with what we did yesterday? Are we going to start Jason and, and, and Kevin McLaughlin again I, for Crow Park? Perhaps not. We need legs up there. So there's a, quite, there's a myriad of questions. Like, will he start Matthew? What's the story with James Carr? So I know he talked about developing his squad and he certainly has done that I, th I think it was remarked by many yesterday when we heard the starting 15 well at least we have a very very strong bench and it is important uh, you know the game finishers something that Mayo never ever had and I know in those great battles we had with Dublin I recall them just rolling on their game finishers going down the home stretch in lots of cases we had our game finishers sitting on the sideline 
through exhaustion or maybe you know chasing the game or something. So right now we have a greater depth in our squad, but with it we have an issue in not fully understanding here at this critical juncture. Well, what is our best fifteen? That's a problem, and I just have a fear next weekend. Dublin, like like Kerry, I just feel they begin to uh, uh, ramp it up right now, and we've heard issues. Uh, our stories about perhaps those issues in the, in, in the camp and things weren't going well. But I think for the, uh, the Dublin boys, for the likes of, particularly for James McCarthy, going for nine, nine I think there's something that's going to drive that Dublin performance and that Dublin team this year. And I don't, I wouldn't write, I, I wouldn't rule them out of landing the big, landing it, winning it. I, I certainly wouldn't. It's a huge test of our resilience and our character and our energy levels next weekend. Hold, hold tight, uh, uh, strap in the seatbelts, and let's hope we have a cracker. That's all I say. Yeah, and a quick word on Tony Gall. Like, like their championship is over, and I think some of what happened was down to that early shot from McCurry that Sean Patton tried to pull down, and obviously it ended up being a bit of a mistake, and Rory Canavan put it into the net. Then he got the red card later on. Obviously, Michael McKernan was trying to wind him up, getting in the way of him taking a quick kick out, but still, you can't do it. I mean, maybe a push, but you don't swipe a kick across the lad. Now, Patton's a great goalie, but that cost him. And now Aidan O'Rourke has stepped down, John. Mm. And he's turned things around, or it certainly feels like he's turned things around since Paddy Carr left. So that's a further blow to Donegal that, in, in sort of a wider sense, are very much reeling. They're, yeah, they're, in a, bit of a, they're in, in a bit of a pickle. There's no question. It, 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 the year has been a disaster in many ways for uh, Donegal. And, uh, yeah, unsavoury and ugly uh, to see w- uh, what happened a number of months ago. Um, and all sorts of issues in the background about this, the academy of excellence and all that kind of stuff is, is uh, and there's no winners in this like i mean someone takes a stance the players have a, a decision to make and they make and and it's very very ugly like i mean cork have been there had, had their have they ever recovered really you know mayo went down the same path doing a goal now and i can tell you it, it does an awful lot of damage to the bigger scene uh and obviously, I give great credit to O'Rourke what he did. He certainly did rest with it and stabilised it. Like, I mean, Paddy McBrayer to be out of injured was very unfortunate because we know what a wonderful leader, in particular, when you lead leadership on the pitch, he, he, he delivers that in spades. And uh, they just got their, some of their big guns back towards uh, the uh, state of the championship. And they've got their credibility back. But now they're here. Who are they going to appoint and, uh, in, uh, as a manager? And there'll be a lot of guys be looking over the shoulder and say, well, listen, you know, what's in Donegal? They're a little bit like Monaghan now, you know. They're just, a, a lot of their key players have come to an age, a stage in their lives. But again, when you look at Donegal, they have, there's something about them. They have great spirit, they have great heart. And I think, you know, more than the, the, the Monaghan and the season they've had, I think they can bounce back. I really do believe it because there's something about that Northwest Territory up there, uh, a little bit mad at, at times, but by God, they have great spirit and great heart. So it'll be an interesting, an interesting project. Uh, can they, will they go for somebody within the county or they're better off going for somebody? To get somebody uh, from outside the county would be a dream. Somebody with real credibility. And uh, I'm not too sure if there's too many guys uh, of that ilk out there that have put their hands up for it. But uh, no, the in a row, credit to him as well. He, he's done a great job in rescuing what was a very, very ugly situation for them. You know, they're in a very similar position to the world last year and they let the managerial situation go on a ridiculous length of time. I'd be, I'd, be, I'd be very, very surprised if this goes on more than six weeks, genuinely. And I think there'll be a couple of big, uh, I think there'll be a couple of big figures within Donegal football not that long gone from the scene. I wouldn't be surprised if, if Rory Kavanagh, whatever yeah. happened behind the scene, I wouldn't be surprised if he's managed. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if Michael Murphy was involved in the backroom team as well. I think they need to really uh, circle the wagons now. That re- The report has gone back, whatever recommendations or whatever are going to be made and hopefully the academy will be sorted. But I think like things could have really fallen apart this year. At least yeah. they pulled something together from a season yeah. that didn't all capitulate. They ended up in the preliminary All Ireland quarter final. I'd be surprised if they don't get a couple of big local names that would hopefully solidify the whole thing and drive forward. Like what we thought we talked about today, where the the end of June. Like I'd be surprised if by the first week in August they don't have a good, strong local ticket in place. That would be my feeling on it. Anyway, well, I think that's what I mean, they need. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned a couple. Of Roy Kavanagh was obviously he had put his hand up to be interviewed for the job before the. Uh, 
um, St. Eudens lost the county final, I think, from, from recollection. Yeah. And he opted out in kind of mysterious circumstances. Nobody quite knew why. Uh, did the whole Carol Lacey scenario, apparently doing a brilliant job at the academy. Um, and like you said there, I think the likes of uh, if Michael Murphy, uh, I mean, if Michael Murphy puts his hands up on anyone's ticket, the boys would jump at that because, uh, you know, he, he's another male man we lost, incidentally, you know, father from <laughs> If, if only if only we could have uh, got him a, his, his dad a posting a mayo he was a, he, he was a guard from uh, from down anti mass bowling Collin direction but anyway that's another story but certainly if they got if if, if if as you suggest the manager were lucky enough to get the likes of Rory Cavan and Michael Murphy or even the Carl Lacey involved that would solidify Dolly Gall and they would move on rather quickly yeah that was the only one of the preliminary quarterfinals that wasn't separated by just a point Cork against Roscommon was a point one fourteen to one sixteen. I have to say, I thought it was very unfortunate. Like, it was a thrilling ending to the game. Uh, yeah. What, Cork went like five or six ahead. Yeah. Ross Common turned it around. And then was it Connor Daly, the, the centre-back, had the ball. Yeah. Now, did he really yeah. foul the ball if he just threw it up and let it bounce? Now, it was I, unusual. I, I, yeah, it was unusual. And I, and I, first of all, I would say, Brendan Cawley as a referee, I admire greatly. I think he's one of our up-and-coming referees. And he's done, I think that was his fifth championship game this, um, this year. That, that was, I mean, it was kind of controversial. Uh, I was listening to it on the radio, incidentally. And like it, it was a fantastic end of the game. And you say, Roscommon delivered brilliant uh, and resilience of coming back from five, I think five points down to level it. And then there was a couple of, your moments as invariably the rains go down the home stretch that um, issue was it for over carrying uh i mean was it for over carrying or was it for throwing the ball up i'm not quite sure i'm not quite sure technically if you throw the ball up and it goes straight to the ground well look if it's the same as more or less hopping the ball now had yeah. he hopped the ball had he hopped the ball prior to that i, I think he had just gained possession i think well, he like just it, yeah it, it was one of those because i know uh, it was a lot of issues on social media, a lot of question marks over it. And unfortunately, going down the home stretch in such a tight game, every little issue is magnified. <laughs> and every decision that's made is magnified. And here's one. If it happened 10 minutes earlier, there would be a word about it. Look, at, uh, I think Ross Common, uh, you know, kind of fell back into that kind of defensive style, holding on to the ball. There was still two or three minutes to go in that game. There was no way they were going to retain possession for three minutes. And, uh, and and get an opportunity to go and go for the winner. I think they should they should have been a little bit more adventurous, and Cork were that. In fairness to them, they went after it, and uh, that's why they're they're into a quarterfinal next weekend. And there's a team like I mean like Cork uh, under John Cleary and obviously Kevin Walsh involved that have really inv reinvigorated themselves. Like I mean after being beaten by Clare in the championship and what they've achieved, and that's the beauty about the championship: the uncertainty of outcome going into games and. I know a lot of people weren't quite sure whether well, they would have had the Ross as favourites. We kind of hear fancy that Cork might win it to get a good bounce out of that victory over Mayo, and so it transpired. But uh, another team that deserves great credit, Johnny Cleary uh, is getting the very, very best out of them, and uh, they're playing with a great confidence. And you know, a team that was lurking very close to Division Three, Four football, D Division Three football last year. And Mike, as you recall, uh, uh, we played them in, in O'Connor Park in, the, in our last league match. Um, if whatever it was 12 or 14 months ago, and uh, the only beat us by after by a point to hold on to the division two status. So Funnily enough, that. John, there was another funny rule came up that day, wasn't there? With Patrick Donegan that day, yeah, it's, that's uh, right, yeah. that's right. But uh, but here they are now, and uh, a pep in their step again. And uh, Cork football needs that, I mean, they certainly need that. And credit to Johnny Cleary and, and uh, obviously his sidekick Kevin Walsh and um, they're obviously doing a good job and they were they were certainly very very good against Mayo and obviously very good because that Ross Common team have had a great year they've had a great season a, a very very good league they've taken so many big scalps just a little I think a, again no more than Mayo really stretched themselves in the National League you know and, and I just felt they were, were beginning to dip energy wise the longer the season went on for them and that's something that I mentioned earlier about Mayo I just a bit fearful that that might be Arachne's heel when it comes to Mayo for Sam. <laughs> yeah, and a great credit to Cork and Ian Maguire with that great burst at the end that allowed Kevin O'Donovan to get the winner. But I just wonder, John, do you reckon for Davy Burke, one of the biggest challenges for him is a mentality thing with Ross Common. Oz, you know, you've mentioned maybe they went too hard for the league, finished third there. But like last year, they went out to Clare. You would not expect them to lose to Clare. Oh. Last week, they were beaten by Kildare, a game we expected them to win. And this week, they lose to Cork, a team that 
you know, they would have been fancy to beat as well. So, like, is there a mentality shift required? I think they're just that little bit short of the top four or five. And on their day, they're capable of taking big scabs. Like, I mean, yeah, and they've done brilliantly well. I mean, our Maz and uh, Males, Dublin, the National League. I mean, they have, they're capable of huge performances, but it's all about getting consistency with them. Um, you know, but I think this year it will, will help them no end because when, it's, when you talk about winning the conference battle with yourself, I mean, they have done that in spades this year. They've gone out and proven that they can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe on any given day. It's a question of consistency of performance and getting that continuity of performance into the game. And that's something that only comes with experience. And I think David Burke has been just quite remarkable for them. And I know losing to Kildare, there was always going to be an edge to that, game, to that particular game. And it lived up to the, its expectations in that regard. And great credit to Kildare. Like, I mean, they came down and they really, really delivered. And I know there was a huge element of controversy in, 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 the, in their uh, loss uh, um, at the weekend. Um, I think uh, then Ryan came out and uh, um, I think he had a go at our, our local man here, Jerome Henry, mm. uh, in that particular game. I'm not familiar with what, what exactly the um, issues, uh, the incidents were, and I, I, I had no comment to make on them, but it's, it's a bit unfortunate when the referee becomes the centre of attention. And I know it's a difficult task for them, no more than Brendan Cawley earlier than we spoke about. Uh, but they, these things happen, and I suppose in tight games, but uh, uh, that will happen. But no, I think Ross Common are, 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 will be around. I think they're, they're, there's a different mindset creeping into them. I think they've, they're, they're, they've done a remarkable job, and David Burke uh, has done a super, super job manager this year. And uh, yeah, they'll be anxious to hold on to him. Yeah, and like Glenn Ryan... He was, like, he did bring it up about the decisions and he was like, you know, we were kind of warned during the week that, you know, maybe not the best referee. I'm paraphrasing and he said it so, so it proved. Oh, like, but to be fair, Neil, Neil Flynn, he had a goal chance, missed it. Derek Irwin crashed it off the crossbar. Daniel Flynn hit the rebound wide. They had enough chances to win this game, John. That, and that's, that's the counter argument. Glenn showed it. He had five chances to win the game. Let's focus on that uh, uh, rather than criticizing the referee. And as I say, I don't know the, uh, uh, um, the incidents involved, but uh, they had chances to win the game. As I say, it's a bit unfortunate that these things happen. But like, I mean, you're, human nature, you're always going to have that. I don't want to go back talking years ago in my own times involved and talking about a certain referee from me. The, uh, but I never said he was a bad referee. He just said, all I did say was he had a bad game that day. And that can happen. Referees can have bad <laughs> games too. <laughs> and Conor McCarthy, geez, uh, some of the scoring he had, brilliant. Like his two points were unbelievable. His yeah. goal finish was absolute class. But um, can I just ask you about the Talchin Cup semi-finals? I mean, down battered leash. The the scoreline was strange in the extreme, really. Yeah. What was it? Uh, 8, 16 to 2, 16, 12. Yeah. And then Meath beating Antrim 216 to 214. Geez, there was some great scoring in that game. And Andy McEntee's done a great job. But Colm O'Rourke. He needed to get to the Talchin Cup final, given the way the, the champ Leinster Championship had gone. Yeah, and they got a right, a, a, a right good battle from Antrim. I mean, uh, uh, you got to give great credit to Antrim. And uh, mm. Andy McEntee had them. Antrim always had, had, had great footballers. Like, I've gone up there with teams over the last number of decades. And be, because of the university systems up there, there have a lot of guys, obviously, that play six and cup football. And you just kind of feel they're bubbling below the surface all, all, most of the time. But uh, yesterday, really put up to me and uh they have a lovely young team and invariably they do they have, they have a lot of talent around the place and it's just a question of, of them persevering and uh, getting promoted up the divisions if they can at all in order to embed them and give themselves the right chance of having a crack of getting to a local final or something like that but uh no Conor O'Rourke uh, <laughs> I would imagine Conor has lost a kilo or two on the sideline this past year it's not as easy as as you think because yeah, and I know, I, I'm not quite sure, did he really want the job now? We all know he wanted it a number of years ago. But he's a difficult assignment there. And I, I would happen to be at a game in Park Tarchin against Dublin a number of, uh, of uh, a couple of months ago. And they were very, very poor that day. And I felt that, yeah, they're, they're, he's a really, really tough task in his hands. But I tell you, the, the down boys are something else. They're, they're real quality too. And I wasn't a bit. Um, I was. I was obviously surprised that the man to put eight sixteen against Leash in a, in a Talchin semi final. That shouldn't be happening. Leash football at times are all over the place. They get a victory. They think, yeah, we've we've everything solved now, and they go out the following day, and they're just a, a deplorable. I don't know what's happening down with Leash football, but they're in a bad. They're in the right bad space, and that scoreline yesterday does not reflect well on them. And I'm sure 
Billy Sheehan was waking up this morning, scratching his head and say, listen, what, what can we do here? But uh, they're in a bit of a pickle. But uh, it'll be an interesting uh, touch and final. Uh, I just, ex I, I think Down haven't been involved uh, with Offaly. Uh, we, we played them a couple of times. They're a bloody quality, they're a real quality side. Down are, 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 are they're, they, they should be in, uh, uh, they should be in the touch and cup. They have so much quality. But I have to say, they've had a good year and uh, they're beginning to uh, mobilise their troops and they've everybody uh, singing off the hymn, uh, hymn sheet right now. And everybody wants to play and put on that down jersey, something that wasn't there last year or the previous couple of years. And there were, like, I mean, there were shambles. Uh, and some of the stories that were coming out uh, only 12, 14 months ago about down, particularly when they went for their, for their bonding weekend to Dublin and uh, all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, they gave James McCartan and... Uh, um, a, a rough ride there uh, for the last season and uh but look good to see them back i expect that might just have a little bit too much for for me with that Hatch cup final mm. and uh one last question before we let you go john brilliant with your time as always who's going to win the all ireland yeah uh, i'm yeah, that's a good thing and you put Tom, tommy gilfoyle and ask him for that one word uh one word <laughs> answer, and, and he deliberated and we got about we got about five minutes on him <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm going to I'm, go, I'm going to say Dublin, and that means right. and I, and that means uh, unfortunately I haven't said that that means that we're losing to them next weekend. I hope I'm wrong. It's Dublin or Kerry for me, uh, and uh, I think we learn every weekend. We're learning a little bit more about teams of where exactly they're at, and Kerry won't be far away. There's no question about it. They're just beginning to ramp it up now. And look at last year we were drawing a comparison between Shane Walsh and David Clifford. This year, there's absolutely no argument whatsoever. David Clifford delivers week after week after week. He's just he's just an incredible footballer. I mean, arguably one of the best we've ever, ever seen. And when you have him firing like he had, he doesn't miss threes. He, he, he scores some play. He's just, yeah, he, I mean, he's great quality. And uh, he certainly have a big say in the outcome of this year's um, all Ireland title. Who won the hurling, actually, John? Yeah, I don't know how much you watch. Yeah, oh, I do. Oh, I do. And a, a fascinating, again, similar to, uh, I just, look at uh, Limerick, Limerick are, are lurking, aren't they? Um, I, I, I just feel, I'd love to see Galway win it. Uh, Clare, I mean, yeah, I look at it. Uh, I think just the Limerick, just a bloody physicality. They're like beasts when it comes to us. And I think... Uh, a little bit rocky uh, earlier on the season, a little bit of off-field stuff for the first time begin to bubble to the surface. I think once they address that and harness that and put the lid on that and get them all absolutely tuned and to stay injury-free, I just think when it comes to the latter stage of this, it's their sheer physicality and other brilliant hurdles as well. But I mean, we've seen those pictures of them. They're like, they're like beasts, they're like bears. And uh, when, if you get in close to them, God help you. So... I, I, I think if I was a betting man, I'd be having a few quid on Lermick. And I hope I'm wrong. I'd love to see any other team, any other team win it at this stage. Uh, okay. Well, look, uh, John, brilliant with your time. Really appreciate it. Great stuff as always. God bless, guys. Cheers, John. Cheers. Absolutely brilliant stuff from John. Could listen yeah. to him all day. Yeah, brilliant stuff. I don't know how we've gotten to an hour and 38 minutes into the show before we've actually realised, or I need to ask the question, like, what... What is going? What's going on in Tipperary, and what happened on Saturday night? Well, look, we 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 should tee it up with Dennis Ryan's comment here. Gormless Shane doing some squirming this morning. <laughs> File under things you love to see, <laughs> and Owen Green followed that up by saying, "Lads, Tip won one game all year and are the most overrated bunch of hurlers ever. Either good athletes who can't hurl or good hurlers who can't run. True story." Now he has really gone for Tipperary. Look, Tip were desperate. Don't get me wrong, Tipperary. Galway should have won this game by 10 points. And I thought they tactically outdid Tipperary. I thought they outfought Tipperary. I think Tipperary made mistakes with how they selected the team. Um, look, James Callan, one of the, like basically the goal from Tipperary at this stage, 40 championship goals, unbelievable. But he's had so many injuries and I'm not sure he was right for this game. And then Galway sat back and Tip hit long ball in on top of him. What do you expect is going to happen there when you've got Dahi Burke? In front, you've got Road McInerney behind, Park Mannion drifting in as well. So I don't think that that was the right selection. I think Jake Morris was like, he didn't puck a ball. Mark Yo didn't puck a ball. Obviously, two of the three were taken off at half time. If Tipperary wanted to try and beat you from distance, the two wing forwards, I mean, nominally wing forwards, I suppose. Alan Tynan, he got a couple of points. James Kendi got a couple of points. But it's not like... 
for example, when you ha- if you had Noel McGrath constantly in scoring position on wing four, and Sean Lennon sat in his shorts, he was not letting him get on the ball. Now, it, w- it might have been, like, Noel could have had two or three points after 15 minutes, and the game kind of went away from him after that. Yeah. He delivered, a- delivered a couple of killer passes, but he was unusually off target the other night. Yeah, so, like, Tipperary weren't in a position where they could kill you from distance, because it's not like they worked the ball up through, you know, a certain am- amount of the pitch, and then were comfortable to sort of you know, do triangles around the sidelines and have shooters uh, kill and go away from distance so that they would have to be drawn out the field. Like Tipperary, realistically, should have tried to sit back and choke the back line because they ended up with 2v1, Ronan Maher plus Cahill Barrett versus Connor Whelan inside their own 45. Now, it was Kevin Cooney before that. And it just didn't work for Tipperary. And Cahill Barrett hadn't played in five weeks since that game against uh, Limerick when he got the concussion. So how are you... It's going to be very difficult for him to come in and lock down arguably the most explosive forward in massive space. So I just felt really sorry for him. You know, a bit like what Keen Nolan had against Aaron Gillan in a way, albeit maybe not quite to that same level. Of course not to that same level. But it was just He overcommitted himself a couple of times. Well, and isn't that the thing? When you're not fully fit or you're not fully right, you often dive out for balls that aren't there. And there was that a little, there. and Quillen was just, he was really cute and used his bit of strength without fouling him as well. Well, isn't that the difference between a lad who's on top of his game and a lad who's like, you know, didn't even yeah. play the week before against Offaly? There's no way that you wouldn't have played Barrett last week if he wasn't right for last well, week. Well, if Craig Morgan had gotten through last week, he probably would have played again this week. That's probably And Craig Morgan challenge. wasn't right against that. Like, obviously, yeah. he's coming back. He's passed every uh, fitness test and all that to make sure his crew shit is up to it. But you can see he wasn't up to 100% either. So whether yeah. it was a hamstring cramp or whether he wasn't fit to play this weekend, I think the decision was made with the performance that he wasn't quite ready for something like this. So Tipperary were outfought. They were outgunned, they, you know, the team selections. But like, I don't know if Gerard O'Connor wasn't fit to start the game. He went off injured against Waterford. He obviously came on against Offaly last week. But the difference he made when he came in. Huge, you know, he, yeah. You know, he got he, got he was in. a ball winner, Shane. He, he didn't have he, and and it's something it's a problem you have. And like I would have always said, like five, six, seven, eight years ago, that Bonner was your most important forward because he he offered something that maybe no other tip forward did that he could win that primary ball. Like he you were Laurie, you were trucking ball down, and it's one thing trucking ball down if you have a couple of big lads with big paws that can win a 50 50 ball or a 40 60 ball, but you couldn't get your hands on primary ball at all the other night. Yeah, look, I, I you just have to give Galway most of the credit for this, but Tipperary were poor, and like, you know, we I kind of explained away the Waterford game by saying, look, you played Limerick the week before, that probably took a huge amount out of the team. Um, Morris and Kyle Barrett weren't playing, so that's two of your paciest players also out of the team. You know, I was will, you know, they were hyped up to the last against the Waterford team that were, you know, downtrodden, that were spoken about publicly about having nothing between the you know, legs and all, and all this kind of stuff. But I think Tipperary here, again, it was poor across the board. Tip were beaten by the better team and should have been hammered. But I would say that you can't ignore the amount of players that are between the ages of 22 and 27 that were missing for this game. And eventually it has, what do you want to say that Tipperary over, were overcooked earlier in the season or whatever you want? You can't ignore the difference that Barry Heffernan, who has really shut down Conor Whelan the last few times he's played against him in... Um, in matches like he really has done a brilliant job in him so you don't have Barry Heffernan massive player and he's he's back for Nina now and you know if the season went on or was two months later he'd probably be playing at the moment Craig Morgan have him fully fit Paddy Cadell Jared Brown I'm not saying all these lads start by the way but Grodo O'Connor having him fully fit Bonner Maherman not being available there people will say I'm just making excuses 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 or am I just saying that Tipperary are missing four or five lads here who are physically strong, who are powerful guys. Like the sideline got it wrong with the with the selections here in in ways as well, and in terms of like tactically being outdone. But there's a lot of reasons why you don't just say, ah, look, forget the whole thing. Tipperary should improve next year. Got out of Munster this year, albeit by the skin of the teeth. But it was just the manner of some of the defeats last year. There's no doubt that Tipperary have improved. You know, I'll peel Tipperary if I get half a chance. Oh, these would of course. But- Tipperary improved no end this year compared to last year. Like it's not even it's not even comparable. Even when you put it to like you know bums and seats following Tipperary, like Tipperary have a big following now again. Cattle and the buzz around that seems to have brought brought with that. They qualified for Munster, albeit you know fortuitously enough at the end they should have been in a Munster final. Um, 
but to me, as as a first year from from Cattle and Co, I, I wouldn't say it was a bad year. They were beaten in the league semi final by by Limerick, and um, they were beaten in an Ireland quarter final by by Galway. It should have probably been beaten by more last year. They would like last year they were beating double figures in nearly every game. Let's call it a spade a spade. That's just the nature of the finish bottom of Munster with with no points. Um, this year with probably yeah, as you say, four to five important players, I would say, not available for selection. Uh, and like I was looking down to the squad the other day, and with due respect to everybody who's there, you're looking down and thinking it's shallow enough beyond 18 or 19. So he, I'm sure from Cattle's point of view, he'd be hoping um, that he gets a better kind of, you know, a better uh, run with injuries next year. Interesting to see whether, and he's had a phenomenal career, whether we see Seamus Callan in, in a Tipperary jersey again, whether we see Patrick Bonner-Marr in a Tipperary jersey again, potentially even whether we see Noam McGrath in a Tipperary jersey again, like three absolute warriors for uh, the Premier down through the years. Of the three of them, I'd say the most likely that we're going to see is, is Noel McGrath because I thought he had a brilliant season outside of the other day. Even against Waterford, he was one of the few that was throwing it down to them in a really, really bad performance. Just didn't have a just didn't have a going day the other day. But yeah, like uh, as, I, as I said, it, it definitely wasn't all bad for Tipperary this year. Definitely not. Yeah. Noel McGrath will be 33 at the very end of the year. If he feels he can go again, who knows, maybe he'd be a starter, maybe not. But obviously, he's still a player that I think Tipperary could use. Like Bonner, Bonner Maher was injured, a question here from AP123. And definitely he's someone you would have liked to throw in. I probably wouldn't have taken Mark Kyo off. And he didn't play well. And it was a ball that he spilled when he could have got in behind during the first half of the game. Fair enough. But I, I just think he's a player you leave out there. Connor Bow, it didn't really happen for him. Although he don't, was rugby tackled by Sean Lennan late in the game and tipped three points behind. Now this was... Obviously, 45 yards out or whatever. And I've no issue with Look, Galway should have won by 10 points. Don't get me wrong. But you know I've come back to this rule time and time again. It was two years ago when um, Galway did a... Three years ago when Galway did a rugby tackle on Tipperary that the black card was guaranteed to come in. And yet again, they've done it here. And it just comes back to the whole point that I keep saying. Cynical rugby tackle fouls do not happen unless you're trying to stop a goal. Why was Sean Lennon doing a rugby tackle out 45 yards on the sideline? He wanted to make sure Tipperary didn't have an opportunity to score a goal. They should always be penalties and they'll stop it because we were denied an exciting last few seconds. And I'm not saying it out of bitterness, but it's ridiculous that this rule isn't everywhere on the pitch. I keep saying it. Like defenders of the black card. Well, did it stop cynicism? No, it didn't. Uh, it stopped It stopped. Uh, stopped a good bit of cynicism close to the goal within within that area. Yeah, but it doesn't go far enough. Yeah, outside of that. Yeah, I, I don't think anywhere on the pitch... I'd probably be All right. inside the 65. Maybe, when does a rugby like tackle maybe. happen? Do you ever see a rugby tackle at the top? No, you, no, no, you do, Never. yeah. You, de you definitely do. 100% And why, and why, do. why stop, would it happen? To stop the play. Just to stop the play and kill 30 seconds. And to ensure that what doesn't happen at the other end? Team uh, doesn't score. No, not... Like, if, if the ball is on the far 45, it's, it does not smell of a goal opportunity. It's just to stop to break momentum a lot of the time. Yeah, but generally, you're breaking momentum so that the other team can't get what they need which is scores the only way to stop these things is to punish no them. I, I like, think I personally think that's way too far back I would say inside the 65 um I would say inside the attack in 65 I think I, I yeah but you, what you're suggesting there is so far away from ever coming in that will never that will never come in because but that, that, that doesn't mean it shouldn't because at, like even if they move it out to the 45 or the 65 then you'll start seeing the rugby tackles happen further up the field again, even more so. Like, but sure, if it gets to that, we'll move it back twenty meters every time. If it, if it gets to that, I don't think it, I don't think it will get to that. Absolute but um, the good question, good question came in actually here. They just said to rate, uh, to rate cattle zero out of ten. I would probably say something like five and a half, six, maybe. Yeah, a C. I suppose if you'd rate it a C, basically. Um, like Tipperary were were decent. Like the league was a favourable side of the league for Tipperary. Let's call a spade a spade. So it's grand. Went down to Nolan Park, you know, bossed that game against Kilkenny up by twelve at half time, one by six, whatever it was. Saw so off Waterford, albeit the red card made a big difference that day. Had some other okay victories. Monster very good at times, but obviously only won one game. Um, drawn with Limerick, Grand, drawn with Cork, should have won that game. And, you know, again, you're talking about being down bodies and Jason Ford was out for a while and all that kind of stuff. Terrible against Waterford. 
terrible in the game the other day and obviously the game against Offaly is it even worth talking about of course you no, were conveniently it, not here last no, week well, well it's not worth talking but look about so I, I would say a C I'm not overly impressed with Tipperary but given the the levels of disinterest that were in the county 12 months ago and the how disillusioned everyone was people now are interested in the team again and that makes a big difference no 100 percent, yeah 100 percent. and listen I think the, I think I think they'll build um it's just two of the last three performances were so flat like just you know amazingly flat really when you consider what was on the line against Waterford and what was on the line against Galway just very very flat um and yeah I, I don't know I don't know maybe does does cattle have a small bit of an issue with the element of peak and, and timing the peak within a round robin but when you have when you're you know, when you're going and blood and guts. Easy time in, to peak when in, you're in, over in Leinster. No, no, I'm just that's what I, if you let me finish, I'm just gonna say I won't. But with the blood and guts of Munster, I think the primary thing was to get out of Munster. And I think that, you know, everything after that was probably a bit of a bonus. But I do think they'll be as I said, they probably will be missing a couple of elder states from next year, maybe. Um, but they'll probably have a few other faces back. What do you make of this comment? Keep the pain going, Bernie. Keep pulling the sun outside. But it's like this, uh, P174. Like, today is one day, but Thursday will be another day. And next Monday will be another You know what I mean? Like, that, it'll, it'll, keep, it'll keep going. It's not going to go away. Yeah. And should we talk about Dublin a little bit? Or, or sorry. No, actually. I, I actually wanted to talk about Keenan Fahey. What a performance there. Conor Cooney, he's left on the bench. Um, Finton Burke's left on the bench. Sean Lennon comes in, has a very good game. And I thought Keenan Fahey scored two points. He set up, he won freeze. He set up a couple of scores for other players. There was one score at the end that I thought was really important. One for, you know, when he took down the puck out with the stick and then yeah. straight down to his hand in traffic. Then he popped it to Evan Nyland and he ran across the defender that was trying to hook him. It was brilliantly done. Like yeah, he was the leader. Yeah. It was a bit of a, a bit of a coming of age kind of game, particularly when he was mostly needed, I would say, in the, the latter stages. I thought Evan Nyland's role was really interesting as well. A lot of the time he was back in his own, like thirty yards out from his own goal, getting hooks and flicks in. Like it's probably if we were talking about Evan Nyland, that's probably not a role that we would have described him as. And and even uh, as a creator for Whelan's great point where uh, where he got he got Barrett to, to buy what he was selling and dive in. Like it was Nyland that held on to the ball for five or six seconds and gave a lovely pass. That was a lovely uh that was a lovely Galway team move as well. I think from a Galway point of view, there is an exciting possibility there in that in what they done well the other night, if they're able to bring that up another fifteen or twenty percent, you're thinking maybe they could really, really throw it down to Limerick. But they, they if they leave doors open like they did for Tip the other night to do that against Limerick, the Limerick will Absolutely barrel through them. Yeah, Richard Hogan. In fairness, Tommy Gilfoyle put it best today. Who'll win the All Ireland? Well, it won't be Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy was great stuff. We must get him on uh, again and talk about the Lucknan days. Seen us for both vehicle men. Uh, a Sully 180. Nyland threw a lot of ball that he would usually be turning and taking on shots, or threw yeah. a lot of ball, threw it around. Yeah, no, he was very, very good. Like to me, it feels like there's a bit of a coming of age with this Galway team. Henry Shefflin would probably have been disappointed not to get big championship wins or win a Leinster title in his first two seasons or one and a half seasons up to now but now you look at this forward line and Brian Kincannon didn't really get it done the other day and he's a good player like look I had him down for an all-star in 2020 which he didn't get but I would have had him in the running for that but you look at Kevin Cooney now he's becoming a real focal point the last 15 minutes of Leinster final I thought early on in this game especially set up a great goal chance for Conor Whelan that he should have finished and you know what's and great he doesn't need to score you know, and no. I know he took on a couple of shots, but those sort of players are crucial creators. Yeah, so Kevin Cooney, Evan Nyland, Keenan Fahey. Now, I mean, a year ago we were talking about that stamp he did in the Leinster final and, um, you know, the frustration around that and, you know, what would we get out of him? But now he looks like a serious player. Sean Lennan, like that was, I would have thought, ah, oh, he's a bit of an old hurler. You know, I, I don't mean that in a bad way, but, you know, he's a hurler. I would have thought Evan Nyland, he's a hurler. But Lenan showed a bit of grit, a bit of dirt when it was required, the rugby tackle, pulling and dragging the jersey out of Noel McGrath. He wasn't just going to let him do a bit of hurling. So Shefflin has brought a little bit of ignorance, a bit of steel to these lads. That I mean yeah, that the only, yeah, the only thing is, Shane, like, it was the same against Cork last year. There was a bit of steel when their backs were to the wall. Do you know what I mean? Do their backs need to be to the wall to produce that type of performance? There's going to be a bit of expectation coming into the Limerick game. With expectation comes a bit of pressure. Are they going to 
you know, I know they played well in last year's All Ireland semi final, but like, why did their backs need to be to the wall to see to, for the real Galway to stand up? Do you know what I mean? And that's the big question going into the semi final now. Yeah, that bot asked me, Shane, would your view on cynicism be the same if a Tipperary player pulled down a Clare player 40 yards out, 45 yards out from the goal? Bernie, I think you'd say across the board that if whether it's a tip person being on the wrong end of it or the right end of it, I do call it out. Like people were on about earlier in the year that I was giving out about head high challenges from Limerick or whoever. Rona Maher did the one on, was it Darren Fitzgibbon? Straight away I tweeted, yeah, that should be a red card. So I think I'm pretty consistent with these things. No, he's consistent on that. He's a little more passionate when there's a temporary man in box, but he's consistent in fairness. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything we haven't covered? No, um, we we haven't done we haven't done our go of the week yet actually. Oh, yeah, um, and like I I I would go off the beaten track a small bit. I thought Conor Whelan was brilliant the other night for Galway. Don't get me wrong, but I thought Cotton Mannion, um, Cotton Mannion totally dictated the game. Now, partly was that he let him dictate the game, which is amazing, really. Um, how you could leave probably the best distributor on the pitch, how you could leave him free, uh, like even if. Callan or Kyo occupied Mannion and left one of the other lads free, left Grealish free or left Morrissey free, you'd say something. But I thought Cotton Mannion totally dictated the game. Um, someone said to me there recently, could Cotton Mannion play six for Galway? And I was thinking, oh, jeez, I don't know, could he? he? He could probably definitely play a modern six uh, for Galway now, I'd say, the way he's playing at the moment. So it'd be Cotton Mannion uh, in the hurling for me anyway. Yeah, it would be Keenan Fahey for me. I just thought he was absolutely brilliant. Like Conor Whelan. I know he scored, what was it, 1-4 from play, and that's Frank in his form from 1-6 in the Leinster final, and he's now probably favourite for hurler of the year. But to me, Keenan Fahey, to produce that performance when you'd been sitting on the bench and Liam Kerr in the football, 3-2 in the Talchon Cup semi-final, I know Leash were fairly pitiful, but that's fair going. Yeah, Conor McCarthy for me, and I just think his, the way he plays now, the fact that he's a wing-back, like I remember seeing him in Sigerson finals for... Uh, for UCD, like he's left-footed wizard, corner forward. But the way football has changed now, he's as a, as effective as an attacker playing wing back as he is as a corner forward, kind of where he would be bottled up. Thought he was brilliant, and uh, he uh, he definitely had a couple of game-changing moments. And uh, Adrian McGrath says, "Tip missing lads. None of them are any better than the <laughs> lads that are there." Um, Raymond Gil uh, Gilburn says, "Question for Vernie: When was the last time the Limerick hurlers covered the handicap in a championship hurling match?" Oh, fair question. Um, that definitely hasn't been this year anyway in a championship match. Uh, wouldn't have been really last year either. Yeah, no, that's what I say. In the last nine games, uh, the biggest winning margin in championship, I think, has been three. Um, oh, wait, no. And that could have been after extra time in the Munster final last year. It's like two, two, one, one. I said it was clutch, and it is clutch. But it's, uh, there's also an element of hanging on. Yeah. And that's why. Yeah, Limerick are favourites to win the All Ireland. Would you be that surprised if they're beaten in the semi final? You wouldn't. Sorry, three points was against Galway in the All Ireland semi final last year. And that's been their biggest winning margin in the last nine games. I think that's what makes the semi final so exciting. Would you be that surprised if it was an All Leinster final? You wouldn't be. Would you be surprised if it was an All Munster final? No. Would you be surprised if it was the same pairing as last year? No. Uh, and that's what makes, and that's why it's great to have two weeks to build up to it. There's uh, so many fascinating kind of ponderables. Yeah, and Rim Gilburn says the first round against Cork in 2022. Yeah, I was down there at that game in Parky Creep and they absolutely battered them. Pegleg Lonergan says, question for the tip man. Who will retire from tip, do you reckon? I would imagine that, like Seamus Callan was Tipperary nothing. Maybe 35 later in the year. A lot going on personally as well, like between business and work and, work and all that, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I'd imagine he probably will. Um, I'd say Bonner Maher is a bit of a 50-50. I'd imagine no player likes to go out you know, when you don't have an opportunity to play in the last game. So I'd say that would be quite frustrating for him. I'd imagine Noel McGrath will stay on for one more year. And after that, I don't think anybody. I think the, the age profile is relatively strong beyond that. So that would be my guess. To, uh, like Tipperary oh Seamus Callan a huge debt of gratitude for the career that he's had so far. So, uh, But it'll still be up to him. Um, would you have any thoughts on that? No, I probably I, I I'd imagine Noel would stay in the fact that he was captain this year. Um and like he played as good a hurling this year as he has in the last five or six years. So I'd be surprised if he didn't stay on. The other two lads might go Seamus has had a horrible time with injury the last couple of years. Even this year he had the, the media ligament in his knee. He hasn't really had a clean run in four or five seasons. Probably hasn't had a clean run since he was hurler the year, being honest. 
And final thing then, I suppose, that dog yours is going mad, isn't he? Ah, he's moving around here a small bit. Um, he, he, he's, he was over at the, di- the door making noise. So I just have more beside me and rubbing him down with my hands there to keep him quiet. R- right, you have a few nappies to go and change now, have I sh- you? I surely do. Go on, I'll chat to you Thursday. Okay, that's it from the show today. If you want to get the uh, audio pod, go to patreon.com forward slash our game. We're brought to you by orgoretro.com. Use the promo code our game and you'll get 15% off. Also, if you want a club fundraiser run for you, please do get on to us, events at ourgame.ie, and we'll give you information on how. We'll see you all on Thursday.